Mike, I see you there. Can you hear me? Commissioner Brown, when um, when we open the meeting, if you could just let us know the timing for public comment so we can change that on the back end. Yes, I will do that. I was going to wait and I was going to go with two minutes in general and then wait and see what the crowd looks like for our big items and may go to one. Okay. I'll let you know. Thanks for Thank the reminder. Yeah, I think given the um, the likelihood that this will be a long meeting, we'll um, just start with two rather than three. Thanks. Thank you, Ian, for making that change. Here's your one minute warning. I need everyone quiet. I will begin the broadcast right at 9 a.m. And Yesenia, before we get started, will you just remind me it's, yes, sorry, I got it here, star nine and star six, just, I always forget that, thanks. Good morning. We're ready to go. Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the February 3rd meeting of the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission. Uh, it is 9 a.m. and we will get started with a roll call. Commissioner Bertrand? Present. Commissioner Brown? Here. Commissioner Johnson? Here. Commissioner Montesino? Commissioner Caput? Here. Commissioner Montesino? Here. Commission Alternate Schifrin? Here. Uh, Commissioner Koenig? Commissioner McPherson? Bruce, you're muted. <coughs> Thank you. Here. Commissioner Peterson? Present. Commission Alternate Quinn? Present. Commissioner Northcutt? Here. And Commissioner Rotkin? Here. And Commissioner Scott Eads? Present. You have a quorum. 
Thank you. We'll now move on to oral communications. This is a time for members of the public to address commissioners on an item uh, that's not on our agenda today. Uh, the commission will listen to all communications and in compliance with state law, will not take action on items that aren't on our agenda. Uh, speakers are requested to state their name clearly so it can be accurately recorded for our minutes. And I'm gonna just make an additional uh, announcement before we open up for oral communications uh, to say that we have a long agenda today, as most of, many of you <laughs> are aware, um, if you're here. Uh, and uh, you know there are strong feelings uh, about some of the issues we're gonna be taking up and those will come uh, later on in the agenda. So please do try to keep your communications to items not on the agenda and um, refrain from uh, personal attacks, uh, group attacks, and, um, and, and try to stick to the substantive issues. Uh, I'll be reminding folks of that as we move through the meeting. So I'll open it up for oral communications now and just opening up to see hands up. I see six attendees. Uh, we'll start with Barry Scott. Well, thank you, uh, Commissioner Brown. And I just wanna speak real broadly to the state rail plan and not to any of the specific action items or discussion items on the agenda. It's been a real pleasure, honestly, and a privilege sometimes to watch as the, our county has moved uh, from simply owning a rail line to uh, designing a trail, a rail with trail and implementing parts of it. And I'm just very encouraged all the time to know that so many studies have been done that indicate or prove that rail transit is the right thing to do, um, that we have the, you know, the Unified Corridor Investment Study and the Transit Corridor Alternatives Analysis and we have a lot of fans around the state and the region that are supportive of us pursuing uh, our, our rail transit plans and building this fabulous trail. Um, I do become concerned sometimes that we're not uh, doing as much as we might to uh, repair, make repairs that are needed. And I'm discouraged sometimes when I, I, I hear messaging that, that seems to suggest that there aren't funds, when I think that there are funds. And I think that uh, you know the commission can aggressively seek funds. You don't know that there aren't funds unless you seek them first. So I encourage uh, our planners and our staff and our executive director to do everything they can to find the funds to repair the rail line and and stay on track with the uh, the rail with trail plan. I'm happy to see that the plans are still for rail with trail, but uh, now that we've done all our study, let's dedicate all of our eight percent of Measure D to seeking matching funds to make the repairs that we need to uh, bring our rail line uh, up to up to snuff. So again, I wanna thank everyone and that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Scott. Uh, uh, next up, it sounds like someone's, yeah. you can all mute your, your devices, that'd be great, thanks. Um, okay, next up we have Judy Gittleson. Good morning, commissioners. I'm a Judy Gittleson. I'm a Watsonville resident and I uh, support your work. I want to remind uh, the RTC to be the leaders that you are. And I'm quoting from your agency overview that the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission is committed to delivering a full range of safe, convenient, reliable, and efficient transportation choices for the community with a focus on long-term sustainability. Uh, that's what I want to underscore, that that's your mission. And as a citizen, I hope you can stay with that. And then I'm quoting from a March 8th, 2019 public letter from Guy Preston to Susan Branston. And it says the RTC is committed to meeting the requirements set by Proposition 116 and CTC resolutions. And dot, dot, dot. While there have been proposals by some community members and groups to rail bank or remove railroad tracks in January 19th, after extensive analysis and public input conducted through the Unified Corridor Study, the RTC board unanimously, unanimously affirmed its commitment to leave railroad infrastructure in place, maintain freight rail service, and institute high-capacity public transit service. 
So I hope Guy Preston, as the leader that you are, you carry forward with your declaration to the um, state, to the director and the state transportation commission. Thank you very much. M Thank Madam you, Chair, Mr. can yes. I ask how many hands you're currently showing on the uh, oral communication? Sure, and um, Commissioner Rockin, I believe you can also see these if you open up participants, but right now we have um, seven for oral communications. Okay, if that number expands, I, I let me make a comment if I can. Um, I know people are well intentioned, but I I can't see and I'm I, I totally despite the fact that I might agree with those last two comments, I think you need to be rule with an iron hand here. People making any comment that relates to rail or trail or the court or really are talking about an item, it's hard to not have I would if I were on the other side of the comments that were made, I feel like I have to jump up and respond to them. And I think you should tell rule those people that's it's your judgment. I'm gonna just make this comment just rule these people out of order they, it's on the agenda to talk about this question and these general comments as well as intended as they may be i think are violating your general comment at the beginning that they should stay off of items that are coming up on the agenda yeah thank you commissioner rock and i i recognize the concern and i i assure you i will be uh monitoring this very closely um Unfortunately, because the items are specific to um, the free, free, later items are, are actually okay. more specific. Um, I'm going to give folks some latitude here, but I will, when we get to those items, um, be very clear that folks should be talking specifically to those items. So the question of adverse abandonment and the question of an alternative ballot initiative in particular, I think you're you're thinking about here. So, but I, I, I appreciate the uh, the I'll be call out to the, <laughs> the, to the community as well to uh, um, you know please uh, address us on on issues that are kind of not up for debate today or discussion. Uh, and and with that, I will uh, call on Brian from Trail now. Hi, and I can appreciate that. If you could share my slide, I appreciate it. Um, I will keep it not related to the topic item. Um, if you're sharing it, I can't see it. But um, anyways, we're calling Brian Peoples from Trail Now in support of the North Coast Farmers. Um, did you see my slide, Elsa? It's not showing. Mr. Peoples, we we did receive your slide. Right. Um, that's, so that's any, I'm not sure if we can't you. get it up, we, we do have it for reference. No, no worries, no worries. So basically what shows on the slide is uh, Jim, Congressman Jimmy Panetta um, visiting with uh, the North Coast farmers and seeing the, the issues of what's impacting them, the loss of farmland um, by uh, the... RTC not working with the North Coast farmers. Um, and, you know, we support it, Measure D. Um, actually, all of our, our supporters gave most of them the highest volume of money for Measure D uh, for Trail Now and Greenway supporters. So we felt that Measure D was very important, but we felt that the farmers weren't really getting their fair shake on working with the RTC. Now, granted, this was the former leadership for RTC. So we're, we're hopeful that um, the RTC will work with the farmers, the North Coast farmers, as we implement the North Coast Rail Trail. Thank you for your time. Thank you. So, Mark Masidi Miller, it is your turn to speak. Good morning, Commissioner Chair uh, Brown and fellow commissioners. I'm here today to just talk about a problem that we all face, and that's global warming. Global warming is getting worse, far worse and people in Santa Cruz County are suffering right now. Transportation accounts for more than half the greenhouse gases generated in our county. In our city of Santa Cruz, it accounts for almost 60% of the greenhouse gas emissions. We need to improve our public transportation system and give people an, al an alternative to driving around in cars. 
Traffic congestion and commute times are unbearable. People are suffering. We need a more robust public transit system. And to get that, we need funding. We all agree, everyone agrees, we need funding. Sales taxes are out. I wanna tell you about what's going on in other communities. The city of Portland, using a collaborative model, engaged with its citizens, some 30 or 40 different community groups got together and developed the, um, a plan to fund public transit expansion in that region. That effort resulted in seven different near-term strategies and three long-term strategies to raise funds. None of those 10 strategies involved sales taxes. I am calling on you, the commissioners in charge of transportation in our community to join with the community, engage the community, and let's figure out how to fund the public transportation expansion we need. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Linda Wills Hewson, you're up. Uh, thank you and good morning. My name is Linda Wills Hewson and I live in Live Oak and I have two requests for your consideration. First, I'd like to request that the RTC agenda please list both commissioners and their alternates on the first page of the agenda. And that all commissioners, alternates, RTC staff, attorneys, and consultants have their names shown during the Zoom meetings. It's very difficult for members of the public, especially via Zoom and especially newcomers to your process to understand who's who. And it's nearly impossible when commissioners and alternates trade off with each other during a meeting. <clears throat> Second, I understand that the February 17th RTC meeting will include information about the proposed Highway 1 widening project between State Park Drive and Freedom. I'd like to request the agenda materials for that item on February 17th. Please include the Highway 1 bus on shoulder concept of operation study prepared in 2019 as well as any updates to that study that may have been prepared by the RTC or Metro or Caltrans or your consultants. Thank you. Muted, Sandy. Thank you, uh, Ms. Wills Houston. Uh, David Dean, your turn. Uh, yes, um, thank you. My name is David Dean. I live in Live Oak um, and um, I would first like to thank the RTC for, for doing what amounts to a very thankless job. Uh, you know, ev everyone contacts you when they're upset, not when they're happy. And um, I understand that, that it is very difficult to uh, make these kinds of decisions and things. That being said, I would like to ask that the RTC try to get out of this cycle of ever increasing automobile dependence. Um, widening Highway 1 with these auxiliary lanes is at best a temporary solution. The bus on shoulder project, as it's called, is not even going to be bus on shoulder. It's going to be buses in auxiliary lanes and buses in the exits. <laughs> um, this is not going to help us with the climate crisis. This is not going to, to reduce traffic. We need to really stop investing so heavily in highways and start investing heavily in public transit of all forms. We need to invest in taking away free parking. We need to invest in making more buffered and protected bike lanes. Um, we need to take some space away from highways and, 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 and automobiles and make them specifically for pedestrians and cyclists. Um, this is very important to me, and it really is the only way out of the climate crisis. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Michael Saint, you are up. Okay. 
Okay, thank you, Chair Brown, and uh, good morning, commissioners. Uh, this has nothing, it's not concerned with any of the items that we're speaking of today. Um, I'd like to second to Mark and Seti Miller's and the last gentleman's comments. They were very, very good. Uh, for years, advocate for sustainable transportation and a sustainable environment for our Tri-County area. I have concluded that our government entities, specifically RTC, AMBAG, and those in charge of planning and executing of transportation projects, seem mostly comfortable with business as usual and limiting their efforts to follow the state of California's climate policy. After studying EIRs from AMBAG and Caltrans, it seems most of the effort goes to finding ways to avoid following the state of California's environmental mandates. The governor's executive orders on climate action and getting around and ignoring CEQA requirements. If the same energy could be used on ways to help mitigate the effects of climate change during our planning efforts, we could be on our way to slowing down the existential threat of our planet and life as we know it. Ignoring these mandates is allowing the effects of climate change to continue its increasing effect on global warming. All decisions concerning transportation projects, housing infill, and sustainable planning should have at its core, we are helping to mitigate climate change. There is no excuse to not to do this. We are still focused on car infrastructure and trying to appease a car-eccentric voting base that has been uninvolved and a leadership that is unwilling to make the tough decisions. As a climate activist, I'm very concerned about the lack of concern our government, governing bodies have over climate change. Thank you for letting me speak. Have a nice day. Thank you, Mr. Saint. So I do wanna make another quick announcement I, um, because a commissioner asked how many names are up uh, and the, the or hands are up and they're continuing to go up. And so <laughs> I just wanted to let you all know, and you all can should be able to see this. Um, we now are again at um, seven. So I'm gonna stick with the two minutes and but as the name as we get into, um, you know, if we get a lot of people who want to speak to oral communications, I will um, have to switch to one minute. I know people want to get to the uh, items on our regular agenda. So I, I do want to try to move us through this efficiently and also give the public an opportunity to speak. Um, if this is uh, an urgent matter you want to address the commission on, uh, and then uh, please do uh, feel free to do that. And if it's something that you feel you can communicate to us in writing or at our next meeting, uh, we'll be here. <laughs> so um, uh, with that, I'll call on John E. Hello, first time Zoomer here, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, I would just, John Erd, John, my name is John Erdkamp, and I would just like to say that I support the railroad infrastructure as a tourist. Uh, my family has lived in the Bay Area and elsewhere, and we come to Santa Cruz very, very often in a, in a tourist, role, tourist role. So having a railroad infrastructure, an active railroad, it, it would help with tourism, and I know that being a member of several railroad clubs, we would like to have railroad conventions in Santa Cruz. And uh, having an active railroad would help uh, with those railroad conventions and help with tourism. And I would just like to say that it would help your city uh, bring in tourism dollars. And I will yield the rest of my time. I know you're busy. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, uh, no longer in Kansas, is it's your turn. Hi, my name is. Uh... Sorry, we we're having trouble hearing Hi, you. Hi, my name is Terry Fagan, and I'm a resident of downtown. Um, I'm a native Southern Californian, and five years ago I moved up here, and to be able to afford to live up here. I didn't, I decided in addition to the climate issues and, and everything, I would um, not be able to afford to have a car. So I, as a senior, I need the uh, transportation of the train and all of the uh, connections that it makes. 
as a, and I just thought that you might want to take into consideration in addition to tourists and the holiday train and all the wonderful things that the train brings our little town and character, you might want to consider the seniors uh, as well. Thanks, I'll yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Uh, Luke Lindroth, you are up next. All right. Well, I just like to thank the Regional Transportation Commission for the opportunity to let me speak. But to add on to the climate issue, we need to be less dependent on our highways. And in regards to a train, freight trains emit, emit less CO2. And according to the um, Environmental Protection Agency, agency, excuse me, an average freight locomotive emits 22 grams of CO2 per ton mile compared to truck operations, which emit 65 grams per ton mile. Since every gallon of gasoline burned creates about 8,887 grams of carbon dioxide, that means that more than 40,000 grams of carbon dioxide are put into the atmosphere when cars are stuck in traffic. Having Roaring Camp take over freight operations on the Santa Cruz branch line would be instrumental. <laughs> Uh, sorry, I'm sorry, Mr. Lindros. I just wanted to um, remind everybody uh, we are going to be talking about Roaring Camp and its freight operations on our regular agenda. So I'm sorry to interrupt you, but just make sure that your comments are uh, kind of not targeted, not specific to that item. I'm sorry, but my main point is that we need to be less dependent on our highways. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, Todd Marco, you are up. Hello, and thank you. My name is Todd Marco, and I am executive director for Nicene Rio Gateway in Aptos. I'd just like to very briefly recognize that emotions are high and misinformation is seemingly rampant. Uh, there seems to be a lot of concern that the future of rail transit and recreational rail in Santa Cruz County is currently threatened. After substantial research, I've come to understand that the future of transit in Santa Cruz County is still a large prioritization but the details of that future have not yet been established. I believe that the public is currently very misinformed about the substantial common ground between warring parties here. Freight rail is center stage in the technical details at play, but it appears to be all but absent from the publicity campaigns of third party advocacy groups. I support and appreciate the direction of the RTC and the challenging position that it's in. I've asserted, and previous, I've asserted previously and would like to now reassert a comment emphasized by Guy Preston. The way to move forward here is to find, <clears throat> excuse me, clear my throat for this. <clears throat> the way to move forward here is to find a way to work together and reach an agreement. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rebecca Downing, you are next. Yes, good morning, commissioners. Uh, I would like to express my gratitude and appreciation to RTC staff specifically the maintenance department <clears throat> for their work on the rail corridor. Since the passage of Measure D, maintenance staff have become more and more responsive to uh, issues that have been reported along the corridor. Specifically, I would like to address maintenance of uh, drainage, removal of graffiti, trash, and camping. Uh, sometimes we don't even have to report it and just see it. And then the next time we see it, it's gone. So I just wanna thank them for their work and I wanted you to know about it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Downing. Uh, Lonnie Faulkner, it's your turn. Hi, thank you, Chair Brown. Um, this is just an emotional appeal to say that with the recent push by certain members of the um, RTC and staff to move us away from um, public transportation and instead trying to implement yet further widening of our freeways. It feels a lot like we're moving back into the 1940s and 1950s where um, this country has been steamrolled uh, into implementing more and more freeways that through the future will require, require more and more funds to upkeep those highways and freeways. This is in opposition to everything we know that will serve us environmentally and our health in terms of not just greenhouse gases, but the amount of tires that are 
uh, producing volatilized um, toxins that go into the air, water, and soil. So I hope that um, this recent strange and unusual back to the future of the 1950s might rectify itself and that uh, we might have once again some forward thinking uh, progress through the RTC that looks at the environmental picture and uh, looks at rail and buses and e-buses as a way towards mitigating our crisis with our environment. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'll call on Warwick Bolton next. I live in Aptos and I'd like to say uh, something on behalf of cyclists and the use of the rail corridor. What's been apparent to me over the last two years is there is a remarkable increase in the number of electric bikes uh, on the roads as well as ordinary bikes. Um, many of the electric bike owners are older. Um, they don't cycle so well and they have to travel on the roads of Santa Cruz County which are not always well maintained, as you know, and particularly at the side of the road, which is where cyclists ride, it is dangerous, um, very dangerous indeed, sometimes. However, if the rail corridor was turned over to be a communal asset for the whole population as a great highway stretching from the bottom of the county to the top county, then you'd have a form of active transportation for people who have become enthusiastic about that. And this would be for the population as a whole and for its health, not for specific commercial interests, uh, not for um, tourists from out of town, not particularly for people who like Santa Cruz as a bedroom community, and want quick access to Silicon Valley over Highway 17. So what I'd like to say is that the rail corridor could be a wonderful, healthy, inspiring, and extremely convenient way of getting around the county for people who live here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bolton. We have one uh, speaker left for our oral communications agenda item. And uh, so I'll call on Sean and uh, then we'll close oral communications uh, and move on to our uh, consent and regular items. Uh, so Sean, your turn. In November, Anna Eshoo uh, made a uh, transportation uh, uh, infrastructure update. She let us know that she had uh, she had um, helped get over five billion dollars for uh, for infrastructure. Much of it specifically for Caltran crossings, bridges, electrifying buses, and uh, helping to uh, um, repair and replace. Like parts of a you know road system that was built in the fifties. This was money that uh, that uh, was already secured or was guaranteed. The money for public transportation is there. All anyone need do is turn on the TV and it's it's a it's a build back better infrastructure all day long for months. There's no excuse to not be not be informed. Uh, the uh, in 2018 the um, um, the vision no 2017 the vision Santa Cruz County uh, uh, meetings an expensive process that everybody on this call um, uh, paid for. It was uh, uh, it was meant to to gather information to find out what people in Santa Cruz uh, want included in their uh, in, in the county uh, the county plan. Uh, in Davenport, this meeting's online on YouTube. You can find this yourself. Uh, climate change, clean water, uh, uh, and uh, infrastructure, maintaining the uh, uh, the rail and highway one corridor, and um, uh, being left out by North County, and 
um, uh, failure uh, county follow, follow through were all their main concerns. Thank you, Sean. Okay, so that concludes oral communications and we will move on to our next item. Uh, are there any, this is item three, additions or deletions to the agenda? Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, there are uh, handouts for items eight, 22 and 23. There's a attachment two to item 21 and a replacement page for item number 22. All of these documents are available on our website. Thank you. So we'll now move on to our consent agenda. This is items 14 through 17 on our agenda. Oh, before we do that, uh, it looks like Mr. Mattis, did you wanna make a comment before we go into consent? Yeah, well, it's related to the consent calendar, Madam Chair. Um, okay. On agenda item number five, which is the minutes from your last meeting, um, the staff has received inquiries from members of the public with regards to the vote. The commission will recall that I reported out of closed session the direction given last time and reported that there was a 10-2 vote um, for that direction. Subsequently to that, the uh, staff has received in inquiries about the, the which members voted in which way in favor or against the motion. And so uh, staff would propose if the council, uh, if the commission wishes to consider just adding to the minutes, the votes that were identified by the commissioners um, on that motion. And I'm happy to read that in the record if the, if the commission would uh, like to add that to the minutes. So uh, before we uh, open up for all communications and I'll finish my, or excuse me for uh, public comment on our consent agenda, I will take that item and see where how commissioners feel. I, I did have a conversation with uh, Director Preston about this and prior to the meeting and wanted to make sure before we um, included that in the minutes that there were not objections on the part of commissioners. Um, I think in the, personally, I'll just say in the name of transparency, I do think it's um, uh, a worthwhile thing to do. We've had requests, we've had, uh, you know, concerns about the um, legality of that. Um, and rather than continuing to <laughs> debate that, I think it would be in our interest to uh, include that in the minutes. I'll, that's just my perspective, but I, I didn't want to make that decision on behalf of the commission. Uh, Commissioner Rotkin. Do you want to just do this asking if there are objections or would a quick motion without discussion be the quickest? I'll let you rule on that. Yep. It, it, if, uh, if folks are ready to make a motion and nobody's got any uh, thing to say, I'll, any I'll, comments? I'll move, I'll, move that we, I'll move that we attach the names to the votes in that decision. I don't even remember what they were myself, but like that's, it's not, I have no, no particular political aim in that. Let's just do what was recommended. I'll, I'll second that motion. Okay. No. So we have, we have a motion and a, uh, by Commissioner Rock and a second by Commissioner Caput and uh, mm -hmm. Commissioner uh, Schifrin, you are, uh, you have your hand up, go for it. Yes, um, I don't have any problem with doing that, but I, I think procedurally, we don't need a motion. Staff is recommending that the minutes be changed to add people's names. Um, that's, staff makes other replace their replacement pages, which are staff recommendations to change uh, particular items is a staff recommendation to change the minutes. And if we're gonna to have to vote every time we are changing a staff recommendation to an item on the consent agenda, we're gonna waste a lot of time. So my sense is if there are commissioners who are concerned about, um, about this, uh, they should pull this item. If not, what I see is that the, that the consent agenda is amended in a number of ways that uh, include listing the names of the commissioners who voted on that item at the last meeting. So, I mean, I just, th I, I think this sets a bad precedent and is unnecessary. Um, we have a staff recommendation. Let's just go with that as, an, as a proposed amend, amendment to the consent agenda. Uh, we, that's uh, certainly- a, I'll, with, I'll, withdraw, that? I'll withdraw my motion. Okay, so we will um, proceed then with- we should make sure the second withdraws his as well, procedurally. Yeah, 
or uh, Commissioner Caput, does that work for you? We'll just amend those minutes and uh, adopt uh, them with the whole cons with the consent agenda. Um, that's fine. Okay, and so uh, we'll go ahead and do that. Thank you to our staff for uh, bringing pointing that out for us. And so I will now ask if there are commissioners who would like to pull any of the items on our consent agenda, um, including but not limited to uh, the minutes from our last meeting. Commissioner Koenig. Thank you, Chair Brown. Um, nothing that I'd re request be pulled. Uh, I just was hoping that staff could comment a little bit more on uh, item eight, which are the repairs to the Pajaro rail bridge. We received a number of questions and comments from the public about uh, why this bridge is not being planned for some kind of pedestrian or bike facilities in addition to uh, the rail. Um, and uh, there were questions of whether there's still possible to add bike or pedestrian access to this project uh, that we are being asked to approve today, or if it would be possible to add that uh, to the project in the future. So we have a question for staff on the I'm going to defer that question to Deputy Director Luis Mendez. Great, thank you. Mr. Mendez. Uh, good morning. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, in, in the um, master plan for the Monterey Bay Century City Trail uh, Network, it uh, shows that uh, a trail uh, going across the uh, Pajaro River would actually be on a separate bridge uh, next to the um, next to the existing bridge. Um, so uh, that's you know that that's that's the plan uh, in place um, because the you know the existing bridge as it is yeah wouldn't be able to accommodate a, a trail uh, next to it. And um, uh, the um, Grant award that the RTC uh, received from Caltrans to the uh, short uh, line railroad improvement program is just for improvements uh, to uh, the bridge for um, from freight rail purposes. That it is short line railroad improvement uh, program, so it's money uh, to make improvements for that. So there isn't there wouldn't be enough money to reconstruct the bridge. Um, um, to also at, at a trail. Like you said, the plan is to have a bridge next to it based on the Monterey Bay Century Trail Trail Network Master Plan. All right, thank you for the clarification. So basically, uh, extensive additional engineering work would be needed in order to redesign this project uh, for a bike or pedestrian access. And, and currently, that's uh, actually not the plan at all. It's the separate bridge. Correct. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you. Before we go out to the public, are there any com commissioners who uh, want, again, either if, you're, if you don't want to pull anything, have questions or comments on any item on the consent agenda? Okay, and so we will. Recording in progress. Sounds like we're having a bit of technical issues, so maybe we can just wait a second here. If you like, I could time two minutes. Yeah, I can. I can go ahead and and uh, do the time as as we <laughs> people are thinking of their comments and hands are going up as we um, <laughs> wait here. So if we want to just get started. I can go ahead and, oh, here we go. With that, uh, Brian, Trail Now, you're on. Hi, this is Brian from Trail Now. Thank you for the time. Um, 
So in 2019, we were commun talking with Progressive Rail, actually Lon Ben German. Lon actually, the banks brought Lon back, so to say, right the ship is what he said to us because um, the freight business wasn't good. And he specifically told us that Watsonville freight was terrible and they were looking to abandon. This was back in 2019. Um, it's so... What's happening, what's going to happen is that local taxpayers are now going to be funding this freight in Watsonville. And you can look at the Sonoma Smart Train as an example. They're going to be spending $2 million a year just to subsidize a freight train that has limited business. So this is this is a message for our community to say, hey, wait a minute, why are we subsidizing these freight? at $2 million a year. So we ask for public transit funds. Well, we're wasting it on a trying to sustain a business that isn't sustainable. Now, if we went and looked at rail banking it to um, the UP yard, uh, Union Pacific yard, which is about a half a mile from the customers, truck services could sustain that. And then we can open up the Pajaro River Bridge as a pedestrian cycle path and as an emergency path. That would be a game changer for the local Watsonville community. So we encourage you to look at, do we need to subsidize these freight operations in Watsonville when it doesn't really make sense? Let's, let's not waste our tax dollars on poor decisions. Thank you. Okay, um, next up, we have JT Verbeck. And please let us know which item on the consent agenda you are referring to. I did not have my hand up, I'm sorry. Okay, no problem, thank you. Um, we'll move on to Barry Scott. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think I'll be brief. I was, uh, I'm happy, uh, grateful for uh, Luis Mendez pointing out that the uh, Pajaro Bridge, Pajaro River Bridge, will have a separate, dedicated, pre engineered bike and pedestrian trail. Um, I was a little surprised that Commissioner Koenig didn't understand that. I'm, I'm happy to share, and I hope that all the commissioners understand that the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail Network Master Plan calls for this same solution on almost every rail bridge, that the rail bridges don't need to share space with the, the, the railroad tracks and a trail, that in almost every case, a new, dedicated, safe, modern, pre-engineered bike and pedestrian bridge will be built next to the rail bridges. And I think that's an important uh, point for our commissioners to understand and certainly for the public to understand. Uh, thank you. You, Bob Burledge. Hope I got your pronunciation. Bob Burledge, you're up. That's close enough. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. This is Bob Burledge with Big Creek Lumber Company. I'd like to respond to the previous speaker talking about uh, the county subsidizing freight recipients. Our company has been receiving freight by rail at our Watsonville branch for 50 years. That's 40 years before the county acquired the rail corridor. And at the point in time, the county went through the process of acquiring that corridor to our knowledge, no issue was ever raised about subsidizing uh, private businesses. And the, I've seen the data, limited data regarding uh, reduction in freight services. It was a very narrow, a slice of time and you know certainly from our perspective uh, our freight needs are going to increase and my understanding is that it's the same with most of the other freight recipients the, the last thing i'd like to point out anything that uh, your commission decides to do with the rail line whether it's freight or trail an argument it, it, it wouldn't be a very friendly or appropriate argument, argument could be made that anything you do with the rail line is a subsidizing 
of somebody at taxpayers' expense. So I don't really appreciate uh, our company or the other Watson Wood companies being in the bullseye for an activity that we've frankly been doing for 50 years. I appreciate the opportunity to provide that clarification. Muted, Sandy. Thank you, Mr. Berlage. Uh, I um, want to remind people again, that's a reminder to me uh, to um, make comments that uh, do not cause people to feel attacked. I know that's very difficult under the circumstances, um, but just a reminder to uh, speak to the, the policies uh, as opposed to individuals or groups. Um, Mr. Wilson, Brad Wilson with Agron. You're up. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Hi, my name is Brad Wilson with Agron Bioenergy out of Watsonville, California. Uh, we purchased the biodiesel facility in November of 2017, and we have not used the rail service that much between now and then, but we just so happen to be embarking on a time when we have brought 26 rail cars in um, actually 20 so far and six more to go here in the month of February uh, from September of 2021 until February of 22. And then starting in March, uh, late March, probably April, um, it'll be 40 to 80 rail cars a month that we're going to be bringing in um, to Watsonville. And that's biodiesel. It's very good for the environment. It's helping achieve uh, California's uh, low carbon um, standard goals, re, uh, reducing carbon and being net zero carbon. So um, just wanted to let you know that it is it is going to become way more active than it's than it's proud than Watsonville has seen in a long time. And, uh, and and that's a good thing. That rail is there for for, uh, you know, to help businesses thrive. And when businesses thrive, the community thrives. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. And we have next up, and this will be our last speaker um, for items on the consent agenda, David Schonbrunn. Your turn. Thank you. Uh, I am uh, president of the Train Riders Association of California, and I wanted to correct the record. An earlier speaker spoke about the Sonoma Marin Area Rail Transit. And his statement was completely incorrect. Um, there is no such thing as subsidy of freight. So um, I can't say anything about other comments he made, but I can tell you for sure that that was a completely false statement. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Schombrun. Uh, we I see hands going up and I'll, I'll just remind folks that uh, the intention here is to speak directly to items on our consent agenda. I appreciate the interest in uh, responding to other public commenters, but we are uh, the purpose of this is not a dialogue or a debate among the public comment. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry about that. I know it's frustrating. Uh, but I, I do want to just ask you all to, to really focus your, your comments on the items as they are presented in our agenda. And so we now have one more hand up. That would That is Elaine Rolfs, and I believe that will be our last speaker. Uh, uh, Ms. Rolfs, you are up. Okay, thank you. Um, I just came in late, so I didn't hear everything. I just heard the last three speakers, but um, I am very interested in keeping the rail line going. I think it's, it, I think we're crazy if we uh, do not keep uh, um, uh, the trains going. Ms. Rolfs, Ms. Rolfs, we are actually talking right now about our consent agenda, which includes other items related to Regional Transportation Commission business. So um, I don't see the consent agenda on here. All I see is my picture and the time that I'm talking. I don't see nothing on here that I can relate to. So where is your consent agenda? Our consent agenda is available at the Santa Cruz Regional County Regional Transportation Commission's website. You oh. um, go there, 
you can find our agenda. We are on consent. That includes items review of minutes, for example, and um, specifically the previous commenters were talking about a project on the Pajaro Valley uh, River uh, Rail Bridge. So um, general discussion about the rail and trail um, are, are forthcoming, will be forthcoming. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> I will now bring it back to move, the, move approval of the consent agenda. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second on the table. Uh, any discussion? Any comments? Madam Chair, if I can just confirm with the motion maker that that includes the amendment to the minutes. That's correct. Thank you. Okay, uh, so we'll go ahead and have a roll call vote on approval of our consent agenda. This is items four through 17 on today's agenda. Commissioner Bertrand? Aye. Hey, Commissioner Brown? Aye. Commissioner Johnson? Aye. Commissioner Montesino? Yes. Commissioner Caput? Aye. Commission Alternate Schifrin? Aye. Commission Alternate Quinn? Yes. Commissioner Koenig? Aye. Commissioner McPherson? Aye. Commissioner Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Northcutt? Aye. And Commissioner Watkin? Aye. Uh, Commissioner Bertrand, did you have a comment? Your hands up, Sean. Your hands up. Well, thank you. I did want to speak. Um, if I'm being called for a roll call vote and I don't answer, it's probably because my internet connection is unstable. So, you know, swing swing around again and give me another chance. We, we, heard, you, we, heard, your, we heard your vote on this one. Oh, no, I know, but it's been intermittent, okay. intermittently unstable. So noted. Thank you. Okay, we'll now move on to our regular agenda. And... Well, so we have uh, item 18 is commissioner reports. If there are members of the commission who have announcements or updates for us, now is your opportunity to provide those. And seeing none, I will move on to uh, the director's report. Mr. Preston. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and. and Due respect to everybody's time, um, I'm going to keep it short. Um, I'm just going to make one quick announcement that um, on February 17th, we will be having a transportation policy workshop meeting at 9 a.m. And the focus will be on the environmental impact reports that are currently being developed for rail projects on uh, trail, excuse me, trail projects on the Santa Cruz branch rail line from uh, Santa Cruz to Rio Del Mar. That concludes my director's report. Thank you, Mr. Preston. Are there questions from commissioners? Okay, I, um, I do need to ask if there are any members of the public who would like to comment on the, commission, the director's report. I see no hands, so we will move on now to uh, the Caltrans report. And that is uh, Mr. Eads. I believe you are up. Okay, good Good morning, Chair Brown, members of the commission. Scott Eads here again for Caltrans. Just have a couple items, I'll keep it quick. First is that Caltrans is um, providing an incentive and it's expanding to, to new counties. There were just a few in the state and now it's expanding to all counties throughout the state for a $250 incentive for adopt a highway volunteers. Um, so if you're cleaning, if you have an adopted section or if you sign up for a new one, every time you clean um, litter on the side of the highway, it's $250 stipend that comes back to you. Um, and it's broken down in smaller ways, like $262 for each ramp, um, $250 for all ramps if you happen to be doing around an interchange. And there's other locations as well, such as bike paths, park and ride lots that, um, and other, other types of facilities that can qualify as well. Um, you do have to submit as a volunteer information, including the date, location, the amount of trash collected and, and other information when you do um, to qualify. And if you're interested or um, others are interested, you can visit clean, 
cleanca.com for more information. I'm happy to send additional information as well. The thing I wanted to highlight is that there's a new project that just began construction. It's a side hill viaduct extending it um, to restore a portion of Highway 9 that was damaged during the 2016-2017 rain season. Construction is occurring Monday through Friday, so do expect some delays. That's near Brookdale. And then there's intermittent traffic control work on Highway 9 also that's um, ongoing for utility work. Um, so um, near, and that's near the community of Boulder Creek. That's all I have for today. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Eads. Are there questions from commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Schifrin. I don't really have a question, but I wanted to thank Caltrans for their participation in what's called the North Coast Multi-Agency Working Group, which the county uh, has set up to uh, increase coordination among various entities, public and private, uh, regarding the development activities uh, on the North Coast of the county. Um, of course, the commission is very aware of this. A rail trail up there, but there's a whole bunch of things going on. And the county set up this working group and um, got a received a grant from state parks and the Coastal Conservancy to do some uh, management and facility planning. At the last meeting, which was a week or so ago, the Caltrans uh, had been participating. Uh, I think they were, their participation has been very positive, and I wanted to you know sort of publicly thank them for. Mm -hmm. Um, that willingness to you know, allocate some staff time and support the work of that North, uh, North Coast Working Group. Thank, thank you. Um, so I don't see any other uh, commissioners' hands up. I do see a member of the public um, and so I, um, Ms. Rolfs, uh, this is a Caltrans report. And um, so if you have comments on the Caltrans report, I will call on you. Um, otherwise, um, you can leave your hand up if you're interested in the next item or future items. Um, so if you're, if you're wanting to speak directly to the Caltrans report, Ms. Rolfs, uh, go ahead. And you are on mute. Okay, thank you. Um, I just wanted to hear again the that they're paying people to pick up trash on the road. Are they paying individuals or counties or, and how much are they paying them to pick up trash? I'm I'm interested in. He gave a figure, but I didn't hear it clearly. Two hundred and fifty dollars, and per what? Per day? Per month? Per year? So, Mr. Eads, if you could provide some additional clarification on that. Or... Yeah, um, Chair Brown, happy to do that. Um, it's every time that there is a, uh, that you pick up a, a section of the highway, the way it works is that um, as a volunteer, you will adopt a section of highway. And once you do that, you'll be given um, basic materials and some instructions um, about what's involved in the task. And typically you're committing for a duration of time. And then every time you go out there and clean up, then you would receive a $250 stipend back. And there are some reporting requirements in terms of clarifying what you cleaned up, how much trash you cleaned up and the like. Um, and if you contact Caltrans, um, there's more information on the website. You could look, you could just type in into Google Caltrans adopt a highway program. And there's information there um, that'll help you sign up. Um, and a local contact person. Thank you, Mr. Eads, for the clarification. So I think the fur the point of entry for this is the the website with the address that you mentioned. And um, glad to know that you're uh, bringing the community on board in this effort. Thank you. Okay, we will now move on to uh, item 21. We will be talking, uh, this item is on the Watsonville to Santa Cruz Multimodal Corridor Program Update. Uh, and Sarah Christensen, our Senior Transportation Engineer, will give us an oral report. Thank you, Chair Brown. And I would like to share a presentation. Okay. 
Okay, let's see if this works. It gets. You see it. Thumbs up, cool. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm Sarah Christensen of your staff. Uh, today, giving an update on the Watsonville to Santa Cruz multimodal corridor program. This program was um, a result of a very robust planning effort that the RTC took on that completed back in 2019, and that was the Unified Corridor Investment Study, or UCS. Okay. So just a little background about the program. The Unified Corridor Study, or UCS, looked at uh, multimodal transportation improvements between Watsonville and Santa Cruz along three, corridor, uh, three parallel routes, which are Soquel Drive and Freedom Boulevard, Highway 1, and the Santa Cruz Branch Line. The uh, UCS acts as the RTC's multimodal corridor plan, which makes the RTC and our county and any project along, excuse me, any project along these three routes eligible for funding. Sledgehammer needed. It's probably that pesky call to renew her car insurance. <laughs> right. <laughs> Just taking that phone somewhere on the other side of the planet. You're muted, Sarah. Okay, I'm gonna reshare my screen. Hopefully this works again. Okay, off to a rough start here. I apologize for that. So the cycle two project included two projects along Highway 1 and one project along SoCal Drive. The two projects along Highway 1 included auxiliary lanes and a bus on shoulder facility, two bicycle and pedestrian overcrossings, one at Chanticleer Avenue and one at Mar Vista Drive, as well as the replacement of the Capitola Avenue Bridge. The SoCal Drive improvements included about a five mile stretch of multimodal improvements, 23 signals, uh, buffered and protected bike lanes, uh, intersection improvements for bikes and pedestrians, um, and transit signal prioritization. These are the various modes that uh, we'll see improvements by these projects. So, just about every mode including uh, motorists, uh, transit, bicyclists, pedestrians, there's um, ADA upgrades, there's crosswalk upgrades. Um, this is a significant investment in uh, multimodal transportation that's going to really transform this area of the county. So as I mentioned, this uh, Senate Bill 1 funding programs, there's two programs that our projects are competitive for, which are the uh, Solutions to Congested Corridor Program and Local Partnership Program. Solutions to Congested Corridors is really focused on multimodal corridor um, throughput and um, the multimodal corridor plan is an essential part of that. So the UCS makes us um, eligible for those funds. The Local Partnership Program is um, just, it's a, it's a program that is available to self-help counties or counties that have dedicated sales tax measures for transportation. The three projects uh, combined were uh, 150.6 million. The grant award that we received uh, from Senate Bill 1, Solutions to Con Congested Corridors and Local Partnership 
was a total of $107.2 million. What I'd like to highlight is the level of local investment that was made. It was a very significant local investment made uh, by this commission and by the County of Santa Cruz. Uh, this was a total of $43.4 million. That was uh, Measure D funds. That was also includes the STIP funds, State Transportation Improvement Program funds that were programmed to the Highway 1 projects. That includes um, county funds that uh, they put forward to um, pay for the pre-construction and the local match for construction for the Soquel Drive project. So I'm going to go through a quick update on the Soquel Drive project. This project is between La Fonda Avenue in Santa Cruz all the way to State Park Drive in Aptos. There's 23 signals that will be upgraded. Uh, there's several EDA ramps, I think close to that, will be made along Soquel Drive. The figure on the left is a um, buffered protected bike lane with a sidewalk. The photo on the right is a flashing beacon. Um, the schedule for the project, they're in the final design phase. We actually just went through a, pro a process of getting um, community input on the design. There were two public workshops that happened last month. And they were very well attended with more than 50 community members in attendance. They plan on having one more round of community input prior to wrapping up the final design and construction is scheduled for later this year. On to the Highway 1 projects. The Cycle 2 project included Phase 1 and Phase 2 of the Highway Program. There's currently three projects under development, the first two projects of which are fully funded and part of this update today. The project improvements include the addition of auxiliary lanes and a bus on shoulder facility. You could see the um, top figure is the existing facility and the bottom figure is the um, improved facility. You could see the auxiliary lanes on the outside and most of the widening being done in the median. A huge part of the project will be a replacement of this old Capitol Avenue overcrossing. This bridge is has very narrow spans um, and low vertical clearance. The project proposes to improve the bridge with the longer span bridge, uh, standard vertical clearance, uh, and um, the project development team for this project has uh, proposed to make this bridge a community identifier for the city of Capitola. And that, that's really exciting because it gives us an opportunity to really showcase um, on both sides of the bridge, you know, signifying Capitola as a city, um, there's options for aesthetic features. If you uh, take out your phone and open your camera, you can scan the QR code there. That will take you to a video and a survey, and you can give your opinion on what types of aesthetic features you'd like to see on that new Capitola Avenue overcrossing. We are uh, soliciting input on those aesthetic features um, through February 23rd. So please participate. It would be great to get your input. And lastly, the uh, Mar Vista Bicycle Pedestrian Bridge. This bridge will be um, connecting the south and north side of Highway 1. There will be intersection upgrades at the McGregor and Mar Vista Drive um, intersection, as you can see in this figure. It will be a 14 foot wide bridge, which is going to be uh, great for both bicyclists and pedestrians to use. The schedules for the two Highway 1 projects, the SoCal, the 41st project, uh, we wrapped up final design and have handed the package over to Caltrans. Caltrans will be the implementing agency for the construction phase of the project. Construction is expected to begin later this year. 
The second project, which is between Bay Porter and State Park Drive, we hit the 95% final design milestone just late last year, and we are working on wrapping up the final design and right-of-way phases uh, by the end of the calendar year, and we anticipate construction to begin in 2023. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, the upcoming grant cycle. As I mentioned, these competitive funds are available in two-year cycles. Staff has been working very, very hard on putting together a package of projects that would be competitive for this next cycle of funds. Currently, the cycle three project includes additional improvements on SoCal Drive, south of State Park Drive. So the improvements include uh, between State Park Drive and Freedom Boulevard on SoCal Drive, very similar improvements to the Cycle 2 project. So that includes transit priority at signals, buffered and protected bike lanes, sidewalk gap closures, ADA ramps, crosswalks, and rapid flashing beacons. The Highway 1 project will be that third and final segment of the auxiliary lanes and bus on shoulder facility. We also are working with Metro staff to include um, in our grant application four zero emission buses for the purpose of Metro's cross county routes to use that bus on shoulder facility and make the 91X more attractive for folks taking um, the 91X from Watsonville to Santa Cruz. And finally, the Coastal Rail Trail, uh, the project will include the one and a quarter miles of Coastal Rail Trail along the branch line. There will be new crosswalks and flashing beacons at all of the great uh, intersections. This project has a lot of bridges. There's two bridges over Highway 1. There's um, two bridges also over Soquel Drive, Aptos Creek, and Valencia Creek. So this project is really going to transform the Aptos area. Um, if you remember the Aptos Strangler, <laughs> this project will address uh, the Aptos Strangler and um, really provide multimodal improvements that will be beneficial to the Aptos area as well as regionally. So here's that last segment. It's just the one and three quarter mile segment of Highway 1. You can see the two bridges over the highway. Uh, this is just the Highway 1 improvements. Here's a map on the larger map of the three corridors. So you can see where our Cycle 2 project completed. And then Cycle 3 will bring us um, all the way to Freedom Boulevard. The Cycle 3 project includes, as I mentioned, some zero emission buses for Metro. Um, we're also looking at including transit stop upgrades for the Metro's 91X route. Here's another map, just wanna show off our fancy graphics here about our um, cycle three project. We've been working very, very hard with um, staff from the County of Santa Cruz Public Works. Thank you, County, thank you, Metro staff, as well as Caltrans. Uh, this project has been nominated to Caltrans headquarters for consideration to be included um, as a partnered application between RTC and Caltrans. We're patiently awaiting the results of that. So next steps for the Cycle 3 project, we're going to continue to develop these projects. The county is developing the project on SoCal Drive. We're working with Metro on the other uh, transit elements. And of course, um, the Highway 1 and Segment 12 Rail Trail project are continuing to be developed. Complete the CEQA analysis. This is required uh, to be eligible for these funds. We're going to continue to um, do outreach to the community and just um, make sure that we are taking in as much input as possible for these multimodal corridor projects. We'll be bringing some information back to the commission. Um, as I mentioned for cycle two, there was a significant local investment and we anticipate the same, if not more local investment needed for this next round to make us as competitive as possible for these funds. And with that, um, staff will be recommending the programming of Measure D funds as a match for construction. 
And that concludes my presentation um, on the update for the Watsonville to Santa Cruz Multimodal Corridor Program. I will stop sharing my screen so I could take your questions. Thank you. Back to you, Chair Brown. Thank you, Ms. Christensen. It looks like Commissioner McPherson has a question or hand yeah. up and then- Yeah, I, um, I just wanna thank uh, Ms. Christensen and the R our RTC staff for putting this together and being very aggressive in getting these funds. It's highly competitive. And once again, to thank the people by more than two thirds who approved Measure D, we would not be in this, this arena without being a so-called self-help county. Uh, these are highly competitive uh, grant uh, opportunities for us, uh, but it, it's gonna result in a safer, more inclusive and more efficient transit uh, network for our county. I really appreciate going back to 2016 when voters approved Measure D that we were able to do these projects. It's going to make for a, a better transportation system in Santa Cruz County. Okay, uh, Commissioner Bertrand, you are next and then Commissioner Rock and I see your hand. We'll get uh, thank you very much, Chair. And um, Sarah, thank you very much for the great presentation. Um, I love the graphics. <laughs> it helped me quite a bit. Actually, and you know, um, I'm almost gonna have to take a copy to walk the segments to see, you know, how different colors change for, you know, what you're actually identifying there. <clears throat> I, I do have a question. Hope you don't mind. So the the brief segment from the Park Avenue interchange, you know, from the Capitola side leading to SoCal Drive. So are any bike improvements anticipated for that? I think it's like two blocks or three blocks length. And the reason why I bring it up is because a lot of uh, New Brighton school students take that path. And I notice them coming up um, Monterey Avenue leading to um, the, the school. So I just want to see if there's anything planned for that segment. So that's a long Was that what? along Park Avenue? Uh, yeah, well, I, I think the name changes after it goes underneath the freeway. Um, on the Capitola side, we have a four foot uh, bike lane and then you could go up Monterey Avenue, which doesn't have a bike lane, but uh, there's uh, Sheros. So, uh, the students know they have the right of way to do that. But from SoCal Drive to, you know, going underneath the freeway and then coming either to Kennedy or to go uh, continue on Monterey, uh, excuse me, on Ca uh, Park Avenue. Uh, I was just wondering about that segment. Is, is there anything planned? It's, it's kind of a narrow road, not much parking, and I'm not sure the bike lane's the best, that's all. You, you can answer later. Or, it's just, I, I know a lot of students use that route, that's all. Sure, it's not um, it's not included in this package of projects, but I could look into that and um, work with your uh, city public work staff to, to see what's planned there. Okay. Hey. Yeah, it's, well, it's in the county. It's not, you wouldn't talk to Steve in this case, Matt, but um, okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, to be continued. Uh, com so Commissioner Rockin, you had your hand yeah. hand up. I'll call on you next and then back to Commissioner Koenig. I just wanted to echo uh, Bruce McPherson's comments. Uh, our staff always do excellent presentations, but this was above and beyond. It, the, the use of graphics and the ability, I mean, it's one of the virtues, I guess, of virtual meetings that uh, you can do such wonderful graphics and they're so accessible. And this was really a fantastic job. Thank you, sir. That's it. Thank you. Commissioner Koenig. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I wanna echo the appreciation and um, you know, I think it's really exciting to see uh, that we're thinking about the highway as our sustainable transit corridor. I mean, and the, the inclusion of the four zero emissions buses really, really emphasizes that. You know, we've heard a lot uh, during public comment uh, about the need to, and urgency of addressing the climate crisis. And um, you know, what I see in this presentation is, is that um, that's what we're trying to do here with these with this project, uh, but on on the two most traveled routes through the county on Highway One, one and SoCal Drive, um, and, and so deep thanks for that. Um, quick question was just you know kind of the, the math around the what we've uh, what we've received grant funding so far and what we've had put up in terms of local match. It seems like we've put up about thirty percent of the funds. Is that what we would expect going forward? 
Uh, and is there any estimates of what phase three of the, uh, the highway project will cost? Sure, um, you are right between the pre-construction, which is the environmental design um, and the construction match, it is about 30%. Uh, we, as a rule of thumb, 20% uh, local match is um, probably the baseline of being competitive. So um, anything above that is just gonna make us more competitive. Uh, and the Highway 1 and Segment 12 project is a expensive project. Um, as you probably realize, there's many bridges involved. Um, and um, we're widening the Aptos Creek Bridge of Highway 1. Um, that's a significant cost, as well as the, the bridges over Soquel Drive and the highway. Um, and additional information will be um, brought to the commission at the TPW later this month. Um, we are still working on estimates right now. Um, they have gone down a bit since um, the last time we, um, I suppose we, we went through a couple of iterations with our consulting team and um, we've sharpened our pencils and we've made some great improvements to the estimates. They're still preliminary. And so we'll be presenting some information with um, some disclaimers that they, you know, the estimates are preliminary. Construction costs are com constantly changing and it's our job as staff to keep up on those um, changes and do our best to estimate these costs. So um, I hate to leave you hanging, but um, more information to come at the TPW in two weeks. Thank you. Thank you. I look forward to receiving that information and uh, just the understanding that the, the more local match we provide, the more competitive we are is helpful as well. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so Mr. Eads and uh, Mr. Preston, it looks like you both have your hands up and I wanted to check before we move on to the next quest questions and comments, if you wanted to add to Robert Green also has his hand up. Yes, I see um, commissioners with additional questions. I'm just asking if um, Mr. Preston or Mr. Eads, you want to respond to the prior question from uh, Commissioner Koenig or previous. Okay, so we'll, um, yes, you do. Yes, yes I do. Um, you, and then we'll go back to into the queue. So I just wanted to note that last cycle when we received $107 million, um, the only county that received more than us was Los Angeles. Um, we did extremely well. That was a very high amount to receive for a county of our size. Um, and um, we are very positive um, with the feedback that we've gotten from the California Transportation Commission and Caltrans about the possibilities, but the funding is not limitless and we're going to have to be very careful um, as to, to how we package this. Um, uh, the Caltrans does evaluate, uh, the CTC does evaluate these projects um, on a cost benefit uh, ratio. So they're, they're looking at both the improvements and the costs. So um, depending on how we package these, we may have to come up with more match in order to be competitive. And those are the things that we're going to be working out over the next several months. Thank you. Okay, uh, Commissioner Quinn, you're- Oh, thank dry. you. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you, uh, uh, Chairman Brown. Uh, Sarah and team, thank you very much. Um, really pragmatic and practical. One question I need clarification on, as a frequent victim of the Aptos Strangler, can you speak to the sequencing on SoCal and Highway 1? Because if they happen concurrently, I'll be swimming to work. So I'll, I'm going to interject just for a second. Um, th they are going to be under construction at the same time, but I want um, people to realize that Caltrans is very particular about when they will allow lane closures on Highway 1. Uh, Highway 1 lane closures will not be permitted during uh, commute hours. Um, they probably will be restricted to evening hours only. Um, so uh, um, both lanes will be open when the majority of people are traveling. So even though both projects will be under construction at the same time, um, I, I don't necessarily think that that's going to make it any any worse than it already is. 
Thank you. I'll just add that um, we are aware of this upcoming potential challenge and staff from County Public Works, as well as um, RTC, um, Caltrans, we are gonna be putting together a public information campaign. Uh, another piece of it is it goes all the way into the city of Santa Cruz. And so we're working with um, city of Santa Cruz as well for the Murray Street Bridge that may overlap as well. And um, staff's gonna be putting together a, a robust public information strategy make sure that we are um, alerting motorists and um, bicyclists and pedestrian of all of the construction activities. Um, so that is in the works as well. Thank you. Okay, uh, Commissioner Schifrin. I think um, um, Mr. Eads um, had his hand up before me and I thought you were gonna call on him. I was. I'm just I'm sorry about that. I'm just going through the order in which the emoji hands are listed on my participants' screen. Um, but I'll, so I'll I'll uh, kick it to you, Mr. Eads, and then we'll come back to you, Commissioner Schifrin. All right. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair Brown. I just wanted to just to highlight the fact that uh, appreciate the commission staff and others partnering with us. Um, Caltrans had a kind of an early deadline for submittal of this nomination. And so I think we drove the process um, in terms of timing, but um, the work that the, the RTC staff did, as well as the Caltrans and others that were involved, um, really worked as a solid team and prepared a lot of great information um, to go into the nomination. It was just submitted last week, actually this week, earlier this week, um, and just appreciate all the work that went into this and where we remain hopeful um, that we'll be successful in this joint application. So thank you. Great, thank you. Commissioner Schifrin. Thank you. Uh, for me, I, I mean, I certainly share the appreciation of how successful staff has been in um, achieving, obtaining the funds for the projects. and. Um, they, you know, it is a real accomplishment. And while this next round seems very ambitious, um, the commission staff has been very successful in the past. In listening to the presentation though, I was reminded that the re reference to the Unified Corridor Study, really that study was mostly about the rail corridor. And we're not doing any, um, we're not going after any funds for rail corridor improvements. And I've, you know, been had to, I've raised this concern with staff and I know there's a, a concern about the lack of competitiveness for freight funding or upgrading the tracks for freight. But there is uh, a commitment by the commission that um, rail is a preferred alternative as a result of the, um, of the T, uh, TCAA that uh, public transit on the rail line was unanimously approved as the preferred alternative with the Unified Corridor Study. Um, I would like to urge that for the next round, um, the staff really start to think about what it would take to get some significant uh, state funding for making improvements for the potential of uh, passenger rail service. Uh, it may require um, the uh, higher levels of um, local match. Um, but as we've seen with many, with some of the rail trail um, pro, uh, segments, there is funding from other groups that could be brought to bear. And I think we need a strategy to move forward with, um, with the potential for passenger rail on the line, besides just saying that it isn't competitive. Um, so, um, these funds could be used. I think what we need is a staff commitment and a commission commitment to um, get some funding to move forward with the commission's commitment to public transit on the rail line. Thank you, Commissioner Schifrin. I'll just use my prerogative as chair to echo that sentiment without repeating it. Um, it looks like Mr. Preston, you have a uh, response and then we'll, um, I'll call on you, uh, Commissioner, or Mr. Hurst acting as commissioner. I'm not sure. Uh, yes, got it. Okay, 
Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Preston. Um, I uh, definitely hear the um, desire for from Commissioner Shipperin to look to these programs for the possibility of passenger rail. One of the um, requirements to be able to apply for funding um, under these programs is that you have a completed environmental impact report. Um, we do not have a, a, an environmental impact report for passenger rail. And um, the very small location of this project um, only includes about a mile of the rail line for which we are um, proposing to um, include um, the trail project, um, which will be environmentally clear. We would not be eligible to apply for these funds for passenger rail until we have a completed EIR, and that EIR would have to have um, a um, independent utility and, and logical termini. Um, we propose a commuter rail project that goes from you know Watsonville to Santa Cruz. It's much larger than this project, um, and it, but it is something that in the future we could look to for solutions to congested corridor. But before we could do so, we would need to environmentally clear the project. Uh, before we, uh, before I call on Commissioner Hurst, uh, Commissioner Shipman, did you want to ask in a follow-up question or respond? Well, I certainly, I mean, I, I hear what the um, executive director is saying, and I, I think it would be useful for the commission to receive a report on how much it would cost and what are the potential funding sources for the necessary uh, environmental impact report. I, I can understand why it would be necessary. Um, and I think it's entirely consistent with previous commission actions to prepare that report. Uh, that would then make the commission, uh, put the commission in a place where it could be eligible for uh, funding to upgrade the line. So I would ask that staff come back uh, at a um, meeting soon with a report on what, how much it would cost and what are potential funding sources for an environmental in, impact report as uh, mentioned by the executive director. Okay, thank you for that. I'll um, uh, just, I, I'll echo that request and uh, perhaps we can work offline to uh, get that, get something prepared to bring to the commission or an FYI at a minimum. Um, and I think we can do that without taking any official action here. Um, so I will now uh, call on Commissioner Hurst, patiently waiting. Uh, you're up. Well, thank you very much, Chair. You know, I am patient because I was first elected in 1989 and I've followed these issues pretty closely. Uh, on and off since then. I just wanted to echo and support uh, uh, Commissioner Shepherd's uh, thoughts and ideas and yours as well. Let's get Watsonville moving and let's get the whole county moving, but let's don't forget Watsonville and certainly our need for freight, taking all these uh, semi trucks off of Highway 1 or not all of them, but certainly some of them and, um, and making sure that we can get our workforce to work. You know, every morning it's um, jammed up going to Santa Cruz. Every evening it's jammed up coming home. I think we can do better and I wanna appreciate and, and express my appreciation to staff for their grant writing abilities and their futuristic look. And let's get these EIRs done. Let's get the whole county moving. We, we've got a great big economy at stake and I just wanna you know, reiterate the need for equity in Watsonville and our ability to get our workforce to work and get cargo moving. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, I um, do not see any other hands up from commissioners. So we will take it out to the public and we are gonna stick with our two minutes here for um, our speakers and Brian Trail now, you are up. Thank you. Um, multimodal corridor. Hey, yeah, this is Brian from Trail Now. Uh, phenomenal work, Sarah. Phenomenal work, uh, Guy Preston. You've really driven this organization to um, new level. 
you're doing great work, um, bringing in the money, designing transportation systems that work. And the reason we know they work is because you're getting the funding. That's why we know when the when you receive funding from the states, we know that. I want to remind you that uh, we have three main corridors, Highway 1, SoCal, and the Coastal Corridor. It's absolutely critical that we open up the Coastal Corridor, Santa Cruz Coastal Trail, before the construction begins. As Sarah mentioned, Murray Bridge by the harbor is also going to be under construction. It's going to be a terrible situation for our community. This is why... It's so critical that we do the interim coastal trail that Guy Preston has been promoting and we'll be having a meeting on on February 17th to continue to drive us in that direction. We really need to open the coastal corridor. Um, and then finally, I'd like to comment about the, um, the request for an EIR on a train. Uh, you know, staff is already at their limits. Um, where are we going? It's it. We don't have. They don't have the time to keep doing studies to keep doing analysis. They're what Sarah presented today is exactly what we need them to do: execute on design and and getting the money and going forth. Let's start listening to Guy Preston more, and 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 striving in the direction we're going. Great work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Peoples. Next up, uh, we have Judy Gittleson. Hi, good afternoon, or good morning, commissioners. Um, Sarah, I have a question directed to you, and maybe I, I had the answers from Andy Schifrin, but when your first slide came up and then you took the phone call, you said their plan multimodal improvements. They were three sections, Highway 1, the Rail Corridor, and SoCal Freedom. And as Andy Schifrin said, I didn't see a spit about the rail corridor. And as you have a huge audience today, all invested in the rail corridor, I believe the rail corridor, both the EIR and the improvements should be top of mind with that. That is number two, or it's the orange line in your first map that I think deserves at least a third of the funds allocated. And we all know that more is available through the current Biden plan. So I uh, just wanna say the public is here today. We know that they're watching and I think Andy Schifrin said it right that that should be top of your presentation. And as I said earlier, I believe the RTC's job is to make transportation available for all of us. And as rail being neglected, I'm just astounded as a citizen that it was not in one of those first two. I think you ought to redraft this proposal and put the rail at the top of that as it has the largest potential future impact on the most citizenry and improvement. And I appreciate Andy Schifrin and I appreciate Lowell Hurst for bringing that out and the rest of you uh, commissioners, please let known that there are citizens who are watching your behavior and that it's your job to bring transportation to the public. Thank you. Okay, next up we have uh, Trink Praxel. Ms. Praxel, you're on. Okay, can you hear me? We can. Okay, great. I just uh, I want to just briefly support what Judy said and what Commissioner uh, Schifrin said and others that I'm appalled that in a uh, um, a multimodal corridor study there is no mention whatsoever of the rail. And um, you also in this meeting heard previously a couple of local business people saying that freight is a growing business for them, freight rail. I think it's time we begin to finish that, uh, create that EIR and uh, put some focus back on fundraising, especially now with the new federal infrastructure funds coming in on the rail, both passenger and freight. And in fact, that ends, uh, I, I would like to end with a question on why the rail um, uh, 
overpasses on the uh, in the Aptos area are not mentioned here. And what happens? And does that assume if they're not created at frail, is it just assuming that, that we are in fact going to rail bank this line for freight? And perhaps someone could answer that question for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Praxel. We'll, I'll keep note of the questions that come up during comment and we'll come back around to those uh, after uh, the public has spoken. Uh, hands are going up, <laughs> continuing to go up. Uh, so we'll stick with two minutes for now, um, but I just wanna remind everybody we have two big items up next. And um, so I'll, I'll uh, call on Mr. Scott next and you'll have two minutes on the multimodal corridor. Okay, thank you. I, um, I, I thank uh, the staff for, for the presentation. I wish uh, there had been some public notice that changes were being made to the nature of the crossing of the rail line uh, in Aptos. I'm looking at the project fact sheet that shows the picture of the plan of record uh, for a new dedicated bike and pedestrian bridge and new longer rail bridges, which are absolutely required. There's no there's no justifying not keeping this rail line. There's no justifying widening the highway for motor vehicles with climate climate change uh, before us and not replacing those rail bridges. It's it's unacceptable. I'm hearing the executive director mention uh, the need to. We haven't done an environmental. There's a need to environmentally clear a project. Well, then my question is, when are you going to do that? I mean, that's simple. You need something, then do it. If you can't get funding without an environmental clearance, then by all means, go and get the environmental clearance. I thank uh, Commissioner Schifrin and Hearst for their, their comments. And um, I find it just unbelievable that we are uh, moving in this direction of ignoring the rail line. We're ignoring the Unified Corridor Investment Study. We're ignoring Measure D. We're ignoring the Transit Corridor Alternatives Analysis. Uh, and and with all the there's this piling up of evidence that the rail line is the right thing to do, um, and we're looking at destroying it. So please do the work that's required to stick with the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Rail with Trail plan and pursue whatever it takes to get our rail line fixed and useful. Bye. Thank you, Mr. Scott. I will call next on Marion Malatesta. Thank you. This is my first RTC meeting and uh, it's been really uh, enjoyable. Um, I have three comments. One is it, uh, hopefully, I didn't see a link to Sarah's presentation, so maybe that can go up afterwards with the minutes. I don't know if that usually happens. Um, a uh, comment on, I, I lived in, I've been living in Santa Cruz since 1980. My family's been coming here since its 20s, but I lived in Boston during the big dig and, you know, talk about, you know, lots of construction going on for a while. I'd be happy to see it happen all at once and just get it over with versus stringing it out for years and years. Um, and when thinking about widening the freeway, I also think, you know, in, if I'm looking 25 years down the road, I think there's going to be a lot of autonomous kind of small vehicles that can use that space um, to get around because I don't think cars are going away as much as we'd like to all be riding bikes and have public transportation. So those are my three comments. Thank you, Ms. Malatesta, for your participation and for your comments. Uh, Michael Saint. It's your turn. All right, thank you, Chair Brown. Um, just a few, couple of comments. Sarah, that's a wonderful presentation. I really love the graphics involved. Uh, and I think all the biking and pedestrian uh, improvements are excellent. Um, no issues with any of that. Of course, as you all know, my issue is with highway widening. And I don't know if you all got the same impression I got in open to public communications initially oral. Um, there was a lot of comments about not widening highways. 
and supporting car use, and, and mainly due to the uh, terrible result of climate change, um, much more than I've heard before. And I do hear new people coming on, so that's all positive for us advocates. Uh, Sarah, I have one question. Maybe this is for Director Preston. On these uh, capital overpass, as well as the bike uh, and pedestrian overpasses, how long are those going to be? In other words, going to be long enough over the highway to um, be able to do the tier two project of the ox lanes, or are we going to go even further to support the tier one widening, which eventually gets up to eight lanes, which is ridiculous. But I'm just, that's my question. Are you gonna make these things wide enough the tier one project, which is down in the future? Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Saint. I'm, and I will, I've recorded your question. Uh, okay, next up we have Lonnie Faulkner. Hi, thank you, Chair Brown. I just want to reiterate uh, and appreciate uh, Commissioner Schifrin, um, you, Commissioner Brown, and Commissioner Hurst for your input about the rail. Um, recently, I was attending a um, Department of Transportation Federal Railroad Association grant preparation workshop for these large amounts of funds that are coming available. And they were very, very clear. Um, this is the direction that our country is going rail. This is the direction that the, the globe is going rail. This is the direction that the state is going rail. Yes, of course, cars will not completely go away, but considering how toxic cars are, even e-cars have a level of toxicity and requirements that hit on our environment that are significant. We need to do everything we can to support public transportation. That means more e-buses, and that certainly means investing in rail. Now, one of the things that was reiterated over and over again at the DOTFRA meeting was that communities need to do the pre-work in order to prepare for these grants. And we're not even setting up to do the pre-work. We're sitting on our hands. When I say we, I'm going to actually point this towards the certain people in the RTC are sitting on their hands and not even doing the pre-pre-work that we should be doing that allows us to actually go to the next step of doing pre-work and then applying for these grants that are only available for 60 to 90 days and will only be available in the entirety for about a five-year period. This is um, just disgusting, quite frankly, that um, the majority of the population, the global directives, the state and national directives are being completely ignored. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next up, Todd Marco, your turn. Hi, this is Todd Marco, Executive Director of Nicene Rio Gateway in Aptos. The future of our county's three primary transportation corridors is bright thanks to all of your efforts. These three corridors converge in Aptos as the frightening Aptos Strangler. What is now a transportation bottleneck is envisioned by Energy as a transportation hub. The three corridors fanning out from Aptos Village extend across Santa Cruz County. Solving the choke point problem will position Aptos as a center point for the county, equally accessible for Santa Cruz city residents and Watsonville city residents and all others in between. Furthermore, and critically, it will increase accessibility to the Redwoods and sea for all residents via all transportation modes, whether private vehicle or public transit or bicycle or e-bike or walking or running or strolling in a wheelchair or pushing a stroller. Everyone, no matter where you're from or where they live, should be able to travel freely through our incredible county. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Elaine Rolfs, it's your turn. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to thank uh, Commissioner Schifrin and uh, Hearst for their words that they were saying in, in support of um, getting, getting the rail going. So um, keep on keeping on. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Linda Wilshusen, you're up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have one uh, clarification I'd like to have asked about, and that's about the joint application with Caltrans and the RTC. It's not clear to me what project or projects are included 
in this joint application that was already submitted. Um, and I'd appreciate that. And secondly, I uh, just like to remind everyone or note that um, Measure D that we voted on in 2016 did not include the new Highway 1 widening segment that's um, under discussion. And I think if it had, and if people had had a chance to vote on this, I think they might have been uh, concerned and uh, actually the outcome of Measure D might have been different. Um, given some of the shenanigans with this project that are going on right now. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have uh, Jack Brown, you are up. And I was about to say last speaker, but we're hands are continuing. So uh, Jack Brown, you're up and you have two minutes. All right, thank you, Commissioner Brown. I'll try to be quick so we can move forward. I uh, just wanted to say thank you, Sarah Christensen, for the uh, uh, great presentation. Um, it's great to see everything moving in the right direction. And although, you know, Schifrin, Commissioner Brown, and, and Hearst are pushing towards going more into rail study, and we're getting some kind of uh, emotional uh, responses from others uh, on the rail side, it's probably not really a good time to be starting this. The Yes Greenway initiative will be on the ballot in June. Um, and uh, hopefully later in the conversation today, we'll be striking the rock and propositions uh, because I don't think we should be spending a million dollars on uh, Measure D funds on something like this. Uh, but um, I think let's wait until after the election's over and see where the people really want to go. This is the first time we've directly voted on what to do with the corridor. And from that, then it makes sense to say what are the actions that are required for environmental reports on what we're going to do. So uh, please proceed that way. Thank you. Thank you. So next up, Sally for Rail and Trail. Thank you. Um, so I have a couple of uh, clarifying questions because I just think we must be misunderstanding this situation. So um, if, I, if I heard it correctly, there are not yet accurate estimates and no funding yet identified for widening this highway south of State Park Drive and all those bridges and everything. Um, and and part of and, and the rail bridges have just been omitted, just like, okay, forget it. We're just by executive fiat deciding we're not doing rail. And and then it's but it's still this project is on the constrained list on the RTP and is um, whereas rail, as I recall from the uh, TCAA has about 50% of the funding identified and is on the unconstrained list. And um, and then, then there's all these questions about the FRA grants that was raised by an earlier speaker. And um, perhaps the staff is doing a bunch of work to prepare for those and we just don't know about it. And so on your list of questions uh, that you're making there, Chair Brown, I would love to have those things addressed. Um, because this is um, this is rather alarming, and, and perhaps we're alarmed for no reason. Perhaps we misunderstand the situation. Um, so I'm looking forward to some clarification. Thank you. Thank you, um, Ms. Arnolds. And uh, we have one more hand up, and and after this, we I'll close our public comment. Uh, that would be Tina Andreada. You have two minutes. Hi, good afternoon or good morning. Um, I just want to thank um, uh, Commissioner Hurst and Schifrin and also um, thank um, Linda Wilhelson for bringing up Measure D. Um, I support the Coastal Rail Trail project. Um, the county supports it, Watsonville supports it, Felton supports it. Um, and just move forward and let's stop with stopping with what's going forward with the planet. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Andreata. I'm going to, um, let's see, uh, we have one additional hand. I am going to, there and here they come. <laughs> so, okay, we've got a couple more people who would like to speak. Um, please speak directly to the multimodal corridor uh projects update and um sean you are up next so this talk about what is the about which is the uh the correct 
use um, uh, 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 for this multi-use uh, 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 corridor. Nobody is, I haven't heard anybody mention um, evacuations. You know, while, so, while a lot of us were uh, feeding firefighters and uh, answering uh, the increased uh, uh, number of uh, domestic violence calls and clothing the, uh, the children of uh, coastal uh, uh, farm uh, working families and uh, driving up food from the valley and, you know, parking next to the, the, uh, the FEMA trailer in uh, at the, uh, the Boulder Creek uh, Recreational uh, Center. The, while some of us were doing that, there are members uh, on this commission working to uh, tank the uh, 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 use of the, the rail corridor on, on the coast. We're all, you know, a lot of people are going to need that to get out. Not a single one of you has talked about emergency evacuations and, and, and the fires. How much harder do nonprofits and first responders have to work year after year to keep us safe when Santa Cruz doesn't want to take care of itself? You know, uh, you know, you know a lot of us are Santa Cruz strong. Uh, you know, y'all are independent, yet you don't want to spend the money to take care of yourselves. And it's Valley, you know, in between, you know, Valley Go Home Summers, that's who's up here donating and uh, working hard and providing services and evacuating people. Thank you, Sean. Okay, Henry Hooker, it's your turn. And this will be our last speaker. I'm gonna close public comment on this item after the speaker. Go for it. Mr. Hooker. Good morning. Um, thank you for taking my comments. I will not take a long amount of time to say what I have to say, which is that I'm a new listener to RTC meetings, and I just wanted to share the outrage that I feel that the uh, RTC is not moving forward in a realistic way on the rail. Um, this is the future of our planet. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hooker. Okay, I'm going to now bring it back to uh, the commission for any final comments. This is not an action item, um, but we do have a couple of questions that I wanted to make sure we got a little bit of response to. So maybe we'll all start there. And if there are other commissioners who want to follow up, uh, we'll give you the opportunity. So um, the first, I, I think, is an easy one. Somebody requested a link to the presentation. Can we, uh, can staff make that happen via our website so people can actually see these wonderful slides. Yes, Madam Chair, we will make sure we provide a link to the application. It'll be on the highway um, uh, program website. Great, thank you. And then um, I, I think a series of questions uh, asking for some form of clarification around um, what is in the, so so for, I guess first I'll, I'll start with the um, overpass questions and measure D, clarification about the inclusion of um, the overpasses and their role in measure D's role in that uh, is one. Um, and then um, clarification on the, uh, intention around the width of those overpasses for tier one uh, bus on shoulder, uh, tier two bus on shoulder or the tier one. Um, if you could just talk, respond a little bit to those and then we'll move on to the question of rail in the uh, overall. Okay. Sure. Thanks. Yeah, so the question I believe was about the length of the spans of the bridges. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so those bridges will um, not preclude the future vision for the Highway 1 corridor, which is the HOV lanes. So it will um, put the abutments at the location where that bridge would not have to be reconstructed if the highway were to be widened in the future. So um, for the bicycle pedestrian overcrossings, um, I believe the 
landings are almost outside, completely outside of the Caltrans right of way. Um, and then the Capitola Avenue overcrossing the abutments are within the right of way, but the width underneath is going to um, basically not preclude those future improvements. And then as for the the um, bridge structures that the train uses, um, I want to assure the commissioners and members of the public that our um, environmental impact report will include the replacement of those rail bridges. They're currently not um, long enough to accommodate the additional width of the freeway. Um, there will be options provided to the commissioners. Um, you know, we talk a lot about the project and, you know, uh, constraints and whatnot, but no decisions have been made. Um, we are still working through that and trying to figure out the best way of moving forward. Um, we have been working with Caltrans to try to come up with uh, um, a package to nominate, um, but the application to the CTC is not due until December of, of this year. So we have some time to figure that out. Uh, right now, we're just looking at the project features, um, which includes uh, auxiliary lanes, bus on shoulder improvements, the trail, um, and um, uh, the uh, uh, improvements to SoCal Drive and um, the bus purchases. Um, we, you know, as stated earlier, we cannot include a, a project for um, a new train service um, uh, simply because we don't have an environmental impact report. Um, the cost of the environmental impact report was fully disclosed in the TCA study, and we did come up with a plan as to how we could move forward with a, a train project, but that would be a future project uh, for commuter rail and would not be eligible for this application. So I hope, hope that helps answers, finish answering that, the first two questions that you asked. See here, thank you. Um, so uh, another question was um, uh, maybe to, to get a little bit more clarification on uh, the components, the specific projects in this joint application with Caltrans. Um, I think I have a, a pretty clear sense, but if you um, and hope, but others might want to just get that laid out and and uh, like an overview of what the projects are, um, kind of in within the categories. Sure. So I think the question was um, what project was just nominated to Caltrans headquarters for consideration yes. of a joint application. So gotcha. um, Caltrans, Caltrans has, yeah, so that's the, that's the clarification I think that's needed. Caltrans actually has a process where um, on a statewide basis, uh, there are multimodal projects that are chosen to be nominated to Caltrans headquarters and Caltrans headquarters makes a decision whether um, to partner on an application and Mr. Eads can um, provide further clarification if I'm not um, correctly describing the Caltrans process, but um, the cycle three project, um, you know, the question was what project was nominated and it was that final set of auxiliary lanes and bus on shoulder improvements and the segment 12 um, trail project as well. So, um, that uh, the package also includes the SoCal Drive improvements. Um, and I, I could bring up a map if that would be helpful to show the improvements again, but. Um, Sir, Mr. Eads, if you had anything you wanted to add and uh, Ms. Christensen, if you wanna pull that up and just show the map, I think it, you know, we're, we are pressed for time, but I think it would be helpful. Thank you. Madam Chair, I don't have anything to add beyond the description that um, Sarah has already provided. So I'll, if she wants to go back over that, that's probably the best way to go. Okay, thanks. Um, the Cycle 3 project is between State Park Drive and Freedom Boulevard on Highway 1, as well as on SoCal Drive, and the Segment 12, which is a mile and a quarter of the Santa Cruz uh, Branch Rail Line uh, Coastal Rail Trail. 
in that. Let's see another map showing a zoomed in version. So this is the current um, phase three highway project. And um, in addition to that, there's some Watsonville uh, transit improvements that are being uh, proposed as well with the zero emission buses. So that was a project that was nominated. Um, the, I think it was sent up to headquarters on Monday. So hopefully that answers the question. Thank you. Yes, that was that was helpful. Um, and thank you for the reminding me nomination uh, for application. <laughs> okay. Um, I think those were uh, the questions. I, I guess um, the the other question was, you know, some clarification about um, our ability under Measure D to um, comp to include those projects for Measure D funding. And so I I'm not. I think people may continue to have questions about that. So if there's anything else, staff would like to share before I take it back to commissioners for follow-up. Um, I'll just add that um, Measure D brings in about, it's going up, about 26 million a year for um, uh, uh, our expenditure plan, 25% for the highway. Um, the highway includes um, uh, uh, pedestrian and bicycle overcrossings. Um, we are hopeful that we will be able to have and find enough match money available. We've already um, used quite a bit on our cycle two project. But as Sarah mentioned in her report, um, there, there we may have options to bring some of that money forward. We, we bring it in over 30 years, so um, uh, we don't have it all at once. And so we do plan on providing some um, more information on potential bonding or financing um, off of future revenue to come up with that match. This is a complicated um, study and um, concept of how to bring as many improvements to the county as soon as possible. And so we'll be providing the uh, commissioners who are our decision makers with options uh, moving forward so that you can make the best choice possible. Okay, um, so we do have commissioners who uh, would like to speak, and I'm going to go in order here. Um, Commissioner Schifrin, then uh, Hernandez, and then Commissioner Rock, and I do see your hand, and uh, so noted. <laughs> Commissioner Schifrin. Thank you. I wanted to thank the uh, member of uh, Greenway who testified on this item, because I think he really identified the essence of the issue that's before the commission. If Green, if the argument that was presented as I understood it is that if the initiative passes and Greenway is approved, then it makes no sense to go forward with an EIR on the potential of rail because there can be no rail. And I think that is certainly what the Greenway supporters want because Greenway will require the removal of the rail tracks. Um, and so while Greenway is in effect, and if you believe that that isn't forever, um, I'm not sure on what basis that comes from, essentially what, if, if we want to move forward with rail, as the commission has indicated before, um, we need to move forward with rail, but we need to move forward with it in the recognition of the context that if Greenway, um, if the commission decides to try to move forward with Greenway, what the Greenway supporters want is essentially to rip up the railroad tracks. And that's what it comes down to. Um, and I think that unfortunately, um, it is, I, I support staff's contention that the projects they're moving forward uh, with are consistent with Measure D. Um, they, um, the staff's been very successful and may well be successful with uh, the next application. Um, there is certainly the potential of having um, uh, a good improvement to the rail trail projects uh, segments as a result of that. But I think it's also true that we need to start being more 
are serious about seeking funds for uh, rail uh, public transit on the line. And I hope that there'll be a willingness of the commission as a whole to do so, irrespective of um, the fact that the initiative is moving forward. I don't think it really is clear one way or the other, but I, I appreciate the advocate for the Greenway making it clear that from the Greenway point of view, um, it's uh, bringing it forward means that the railroad, there will, not be, there will be no possibility of rail service on the corridor. Hey, uh, Commissioner Hernandez, I, before I call on you, I just want to say that um, in just, you know, res respecting the a comment that was made at oral communications about being clear about who is present for what, in, under, in what role um, on our webinar or our um, uh, meeting today, uh, I believe that Commissioner Hernandez, you are, you are filling in now that Commissioner Caput has had to leave. And so you are acting in that role as commission alternate. Is that correct? And I think you're muted. Correct. Yes. Okay. I just wanted to be, so the public is, it is hard. I, I sometimes <laughs> am not sure. So I just want to make sure we're all clear. Um, and I will call on you, Commissioner Hernandez, uh, for comment, questions, et cetera. Yeah. So, you know, I also just wanted to uh, thank Commissioner Shifford and Hurst for their comments and that I'm in full agreement with, you know, this is really about, you know, equity, equity for the county, equity for South County. You know, it's about our environment and keeping the rail line. It's about, you know, reducing greenhouse gases and reducing vehicle miles traveled. And it's about our economy. You know, we need to preserve the rail line and restore the bridges for rail because number one, we need to preserve freight. Number two, South County is the backbone workforce for the county. Uh, not just the county, but Santa Cruz as well for the tourist economy, for the re for retail sales, the restaurant industry, and you know we need to preserve that as well our our local economy. So we need to analyze this, seek funds, and we need to protect and preserve the rail line, and take the necessary steps to do that as well. Um, you know, like I said, this is about equity throughout the county and being responsible stewards for our environment and our local economy. And that's it. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Rotkin, you're up next. Thank you. First, um, in terms of identifying ourselves, there's a uh, procedure on the uh, Zoom calls where you can rename yourself. And I would suggest not now, but for future meetings that the commissioners all put in front of their name, C-O-M-M, -M, or something brief, so it has space to fit on the bottom there, along with their name, and the alternates have alt commission, alt com or something. So that might be an easy, because the staff can't make that happen, I don't think so easily, because we name ourselves, or our computers name us. I have to change mine to Mike from Michael every time, so that might be something, just a short suggestion. Maybe staff could think about that and send out a memo suggesting a way to fix that problem. Um, my comment. Um, I need to be corrected if I'm wrong, but I, I think we had proposed in front of the commission a business plan that um, failed on a 6-6 vote. That business plan included within it a 30% engineering design and an EIR on that 30% uh, design. That would have been the EIR work necessary to be applying. You don't have to do, I don't think, believe more than, correct me again if any of these things are wrong that we don't need to do more than a 30% design of the rail in order to have the environmental work done necessary to apply for these state funds that we're talking about and other funds that we're talking about. At the conclusion of that, our, our executive director, Guy Preston, said that although, you know, it, it didn't pass, but it also, it wasn't as if there's a clear majority. We're at loggerheads at a 6-6. So the business plan was not approved. The staff did not get to work on the 30% engineering design, which, you know, cost money and uh, so forth, sort of, I think, waiting for some clarification of where the commission wants to go. Again, any of these things I'm saying, please correct me if I'm not understanding this. However, when asked directly, Guy Preston said, that didn't mean the staff weren't still looking at the issue of where they might get rail funding in the future and so forth. We had that at a, at a, in a public meeting, an announcement about it. Now there's been uh, some suggestion that um, 
that you know the commission hasn't certainly given clear again the six six votes not clear priority is uh, critical that we get going on the EIR work on the rail but there also is not a clear rejection of that the commission didn't say stop we don't want rail we want to move to a trail now people are suggesting that we'll have a vote I'll, I'll save most of my comments on this for a later item on our agenda but that there's that uh, we're going to have a vote that might clarify where the commission wants to go on this or maybe the public vote would change somebody's mind about might change mine, I'll say that, on where we want to go, depending on what happens in that vote uh, this June. Um, do I understand correctly the situation that we're in? And I guess I want to ask Guy again, our executive director, Guy Preston, whether in fact the staff's in a position to apply for funding for the environmental work that, that was called the pre-construction work that's necessary. I think a lot of people ask that question. I'm trying to get on point on that, on that question. So passage of the business plan, um, was not really the is not really an issue with being able to to seek funding and move forward. It, it was the business plan was its own plan of how we could potentially fund uh, commuter rail in the future. The price tag was fairly high. The overall price was you know almost a half a billion dollars for a commuter rail project. Um, and then 25 uh, million a year for operations and maintenance. Um, we put together a plan of how we could apply for grant funding, um, including for the EIR, um, but um, that requires a local match. And um, uh, we could use some measure D fund for the environmental document, but that same measure D pot that would allow us to use funding for the environmental um, uh, report is also um, used to preserve the rail infrastructure. Fixing bad, fixing that, and so that, forth. that we have to, to use to, uh, to to work on the rail line right now for freight rail, which is, I'll bring up later. So we're spending the money that we could be using for the EIR on uh, improvements that are needed to preserve the rail right away for freight right now, um, and it seriously limits our ability to fund. An environmental impact report. Any project for the rail line would have to, again, and I mentioned this earlier, um, have its own EIR and have logical termini and independent utility. Um, our project was for a full system between Watsonville and Santa Cruz. It's a fairly large price tag. Um, this program alone that we're applying for would not be enough. Uh, there were several different programs that we looked at that we would have to couple together along with local funding to be able to fund a rail project. Um, purely applying for a piece of a commuter rail project that didn't provide the actual service would not compete well for this funding. Um, it, it wouldn't compete at all. Um, the, the, the state looks at these things very seriously. Um, other counties are applying for the funding as well, and um, they're going to direct the funding towards projects that um, have the, the environmental clearance necessary and um, a full funding path to develop to deliver the full project. Um, they don't consider benefits for a future project that's not funded. So adding costs to a project that doesn't come with the benefits makes your project compete poorly. So we would need to first identify a way of moving forward with an environmental document, and then we would come up with a, an entirely different strategy for delivering passenger rail than the strategy that we're using for the, the highway, the multimodal uh, corridor projects that we're moving forward with right now, which are centered along the highway with bicycle and pedestrian improvements. And I hope that answers your question. It does, thank you. Others may want to comment on that the choice we have or what the alternative, in effect, the only other question I have is too big for this meeting today, but what the alternative ways of perhaps getting the environmental piece of it funded, um, you know, without the business plan, without the, you know, the request for the, um, uh, you know, the half billion dollar, whatever the cost might be in the future. but. Um, so we actually are in a practical position to start applying for the environmental work that would make it uh, this at least eligible to begin thinking about those kinds of uh, commitments. I'll stop with that. Thank you. Um, okay, I see Commissioner 
Quinn, you have your hand up. Go for it. Oh, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, just two comments. Number one, it, it's a bit disappointing to hear comments from the public and even ourselves that uh, impugn the motives of the RTC staff or what people are doing. I, I don't think there's good guys and bad guys. I think we all agree we need to get the county moving and reduce greenhouse gases. And the debate should really be about using the data. What's the best way to achieve those goals? Um, second, I just want to clarify, we've heard a lot about freight, and I would ask uh, Chairperson Preston to confirm when was the last time freight was moved on the line and what was the experience of the last couple of freight carriers? Director Preston. I'm gonna, I'm gonna discuss a lot of this in my report moving forward, but the rail line has been down since 2017, so there's been no freight on the line since uh, 2017. Um, there was some minor freight um, prior to that, um, up until about 2010, um, going backwards. 2010, uh, the cement uh, plant closed, and that was the last time we had significant freight on the line beyond Watsonville. All right, thank you. Um, for uh, Commissioner Johnson, Randy Johnson, go for it. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to emphasize uh, the interaction between uh, Guy Preston and, and, and uh, Mike. Um, and I so fully appreciate the answer, right? I mean, his response was, it does not compete. And I fully appreciate uh, Executive Director Preston because he's a professional. He's been around. He knows these things. And in some ways, the public, and it's and this is not a slight against them, and also to certain commissioners, we're kind of amateurs, okay? So people who were upset that we're not doing enough, we're not doing this, we're not doing that, there's kind of a rational reasons why we weren't doing that. And yet people tried to impugn and express total satisfaction. I don't see spit, and I can't do this, and why aren't you doing that? Um, I just want to say that I appreciate having a professional of that of that character um, and magnitude that kind of guides us through pretty tricky stuff. And so that's really all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Um, Commissioner Rotkin. Uh, just really, just really quickly, I, I think Randy's correct in his attribution that some of the members of the public were making, you know, attempting to make attacks on the staff or uh, the executive director, let me be really clear. That was not my intent. I'm just trying to clarify where we're at. I have huge respect for High Preston and the work that he's doing for us. And I don't think I said anything directly. And I certainly didn't mean to imply in any way that somehow something was amiss. I was just trying to clarify what, how we're moving forward and what we're moving. It's in a way it's trying to get an answer to those, even though they were put in a hostile way, the questions people were asking, where are we at in this application? And if we're not applying for this, one kind of fund or another, why is that the case? So let me be really clear about yeah. that. I, 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 I hope it's clear, Andy. I, that was not my intent at all. It wasn't directed, Mike, it wasn't directed at you at all. So we're good. Okay, I'm gonna um, bring it back around. It, it looks like we, uh, commissioners who have, you know, wanted to comment or ask questions and clarification on this item are, are finished. And this is uh, an informational item. Um, an update for us. So um, I, I want to get us moving on to our two big items. Uh, we just, a, first I'll say, I want to just say, a, you know, really thank you so much to our staff, Sarah, uh, in particular for putting together this presentation, all of the work that you've done to make this happen. And, you know, while our, our uh, discussions tend to get, um, however intentionally or unintentionally uh, migrated over or hijacked by the, the, the rail corridor and what is to be that debate, there is all of this other work going on that's absolutely part of our, um, our transportation planning. And uh, you've done an amazing job of uh, making it happen and presenting it to us. So I just wanted to, to end with, with that comment. And um, we will move on now uh, it is 11, almost 11.30, and we have our, our next item up that is, you know, hotly, hotly contested and debated and discussed and um, uh, wide interest on this item. It's item 22, an informational report on the potential preservation of the Santa Cruz branch line by rail banking 
including future potential adverse abandonment actions for heavy freight rail only and termination of the ACL agreement. I want to set up this item uh, so that we can move through it as smoothly as possible. And again, um, with uh, you know strong, strong encouragement to um, keep your your comments and and the the discourse that goes on um, civil uh, and to be focused on the issues and not impugning the motives or reputations of uh, various stakeholders in this process. Uh, we will have a staff report and then uh, we will have an opportunity for commissioners to ask questions about the staff report and, and the issue. We will then go to public comments and I, um, given how long it has taken to get through the first items here and that we have another uh, potentially uh, an item of, of interest, I, I, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start, I would like to start with a, a minute and a half for uh, comment when that time comes. I'm just laying this out here uh, before we get started. So we will do a minute and a half and there are 184 attendees of this meeting. I wanna appreciate our staff for setting it up so that we could have um, up to 500 uh, people participate in this meeting, given the great level of interest in this item and related items. So um, we, are, uh, we are here and we have a lot of people who are likely gonna to wanna to speak, but I'd like to start out with that staff presentation and then we will, um, take a break um, for uh, before we go to public comment. So uh, staff presentation, and then um, we'll take a break. That'll give people a chance to shake it out and dance it out or whatever you wanna do. <laughs> Get your feelings and your comments in order and we will, um, and then we'll proceed. Uh, Commissioner Rotkin, question from you. Yes, could you, you or uh, Executive Director Preston clarify uh, the that whether this is or is not an information item yes. and what, what bearing that has on whether we can or cannot make decisions today yes. about anything. Yes, absolutely. That's um, that that was my next, I made, I even made notes. So I made sure I had to cover everything. Um, yeah, so this is, so this item um, has uh, generated a, a wide interest. And um, so I'll just give a couple of comments about from my perspective, we've received, um, most of us, I think, have received all the same messages, over 6,000 messages on this item. There is some confusion about what the purpose of the, uh, well, the issue in general is very complex. So um, it's going to take some time to work that through and, and you know, hopefully we can get people's questions answered. But um, the intention today is to put, have this on our open session so that um, we can have a conversation about it, learn more, and it is not anticipated that action will be taken today. So for those of you who are here uh, simply to say vote no, um, the, we, we will not be voting today. Um, so please just give a, your comments on, on the item at hand and um, you know, how, you're feel, how you feel. Uh, we'll do that with a minute and a half each after we get a presentation from Mr. Preston. Uh, and um, I don't know if our um, RTC attorney, if a council has anything you want to include in, as part of this, but I'll, I'll open it up to Director Preston and Mr. Mattis, uh, and then we'll take a break. Madam Chair, I do not have anything to add to your comments at the moment. I defer okay. to Mr. Preston for his presentation. Great, thank you. Okay, so Mr. Preston, you're up. Thank you, um, Madam Chair, uh, Commissioners, and members of the public. Um, uh, first, I'll start out with an apology. My presentation is not going to be as sexy as Sarah's. Um, I don't have any uh, graphics to share with you. Um, it's just going to be discussion. Um, you know, as you say, that this is an informational report on the preservation of the Santa Cruz Grand Trail line. Um, staff recommends that the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission consider this informational item, take public comment and advise staff of any additional questions or information requests the commission may have regarding the potential for preservation of the Santa Cruz Grand Trail line by rail bank, including potentially filing adverse abandonment actions for heavy freight rail only on the Santa Cruz branch rail line and the Felton branch 
line and allowing for the termination of the administrative coordination and license agreement with St. Paul and Pacific Railways. As this is an informational item only, there is no commission action anticipated as part of this item. I would like to start today's discussion with an acknowledgement about the concerns, questions, and divisions that this item has created for our community. The public process is extremely important. This discussion about how best to preserve and use the Santa Cruz branch rail line in order to address transportation needs and move forward with a successful program of projects is part of that process. Although this commission has stated its interest in ultimately using the Santa Cruz branch rail line for commuter rail and a trail, this report is focused on freight rail, but also discusses the current use of the line for recreational rail and the challenges associated with building a trail within the railroad right away. Roaring Camp is separate from, uh, Roaring Camp Stelt line is separate from the Santa Cruz branch rail line, but the two lines connect on Chestnut Street at about the intersection of Maple Street in downtown Santa Cruz. Roaring Camp uses a portion of the Santa Cruz branch rail line for their iconic beach train, which RTC respects and would absolutely like to see remain long-term. Roaring Camp's Felton branch line is also part of the federal freight network and Santa Cruz and Big Trees Railway owned by Roaring Camp is a designated common carrier of freight with the obligation to provide freight service on reasonable demand. Roaring Camp will be affected by whatever RTC does or doesn't do on the Santa Cruz branch rail line. Ever since our current freight operator, St. Paul and Pacific Railroad provided notices of intent to terminate the administrative coordination and license agreement, and I'll here and after refer to that as the ACL agreement, and abandon the Santa Cruz branch rail line, the commission has been considering options, including potential assignment of the ACL agreement, termination of the ACL agreement, and potentially rail banking the line. Rail banking has come up at several prior RTC public meetings, but there is a need to discuss key issues in more depth so that commissioners and the public gain a better understanding of the potential benefits and key challenges. This will be an opportunity to learn about community concerns and to understand what additional information is needed to make future decisions. So let's start with some background on the ACL agreement. RTC is not a freight operator. We contract out freight service to a short lane operator. The ACL agreement is that contract. The current ACL agreement contracts freight rail to St. Paul and Pacific Railroad, who holds the freight easement on the Santa Cruz branch rail line. This ACL agreement is our third such freight license agreement since purchasing the line in 2012. The template for the ACL agreement is based on the concept that the rail line could primarily pay for itself with revenue from freight and recreational rail. In 2018, after Iowa Pacific, our second operator, neglected the line and used the line mainly to store rail cars in the Watsonville area, RTC sought its third operator. However, the line was down and in a serious state of disrepair. 2017 storms completely washed out two locations and there was storm damage to a total of seven sites. RTC needed a debris removal contract for the entire line. Therefore, when St. Paul and Pacific Railroad negotiated the current ACL agreement with RTC, they required that RTC perform initial repairs on the line. Initial repairs include all storm damage, as well as damaged bridges, overpasses, trestles, culvert, and track. RTC secured FEMA funding for the storm damage repairs. We now also have Measure D to use on rail preservation and studies. However, the cost of all repairs far exceeds available revenue. State and federal funding for freight repairs is also limited and the Santa Cruz branch rail line does not compete well against other high priority freight projects in other regions of the state. A high priority freight transportation project in California would be work at the Port of Oakland, the Port of Long Beach, 
or one of the railways or highways leading to those facilities. RTC has expended approximately $5 million in repairs on the seven storm damage projects alone. And we are awaiting reimbursement from the Federal Emergency Management Administration, or FEMA. It is possible that we will not receive full reimbursement. We have also spent about a million dollars in Measure D rail preservation funds for an emergency bridge repair near Gallagher Slough. We awarded a $700,000 contract for a retaining wall above Manresa Beach at our last meeting and spent significant funding on drainage repairs, track repairs, vegetation control, and other work needed for the rail line. We, have an, we had an item on today's consent agreement, excuse me, today's um, consent calendar for an agreement to rehabilitate the Pajaro Bridge. Although the state is providing 50% of the construction funding, RTC is covering the balance. The Pajaro Bridge is the only freight rail project that we have received competitive grant funding for, and that is because it is located in Watsonville, where we actually have freight service. Despite that progress, staff estimates another 50 to 65 million of additional repairs necessary to restore regular freight service. This estimate is for repairs needed for only freight service. It's not for commuter rail, it's not for the trail. As good of a time as it may seem to apply for and receive grant funding to pay for rail repairs, the likelihood of getting funding for freight will be based on project performance measures. Since we don't currently move freight and have limited prospects for freight service beyond Watsonville, we will not compete well for federal and state grant funding programs designed for freight movement. So why is RTC discussing rail banking? Initially, RTC started discussing rail banking as a potential response to St. Paul and Pacific's notice of intent to abandon the Santa Cruz branch rail line. If St. Paul and Pacific were to follow through with that notice and RTC were to take no action, RTC would be at risk of losing the continuity of the rail line. So why is that? Railroad title issues are complicated. RTC holds a mix of B and easement ownership interests in the Santa Cruz branch rail line. Upon complete abandonment, a railroad may lose any rights to possess or transfer parcels of land within the corridor to which it merely held an easement and whose use is limited to railroad purposes. RTC understandably took the abandonment notice very seriously and staff started exploring rail banking as a, possi as a possible method to preserve the right of way. So what is rail banking? Rail banking was designed to prevent railroad easements from reverting under state law to an underlining fee owner after a railroad discontinues service. Rail banking provides an alternative to completely abandoning a railroad right away by allowing a railroad to negotiate a trail use agreement with a prospective trail operator while preserving the rail right away for potential future freight reactivation. Rail banking is a voluntary process whereby a freight railroad company and a trail agency enter into an agreement to use a rail corridor that has been approved for an abandonment as a trail or for some other use, including commuter rail or rail with trail until some future time when the railroad might need the corridor again for freight rail service. As RTC explored this option, we also found that rail banking would provide relief to property rights issues associated with our planned construction of a trail within the Santa Cruz branch rail line right away, even if there is no desire to, move, to remove the rail. As mentioned earlier, some of the rail property is held as easements for rail purposes, which creates potential complications in constructing a trail as underlining property owners could claim that a trail is not rail and is therefore not permitted on the easement. Although this situation may not seem significant, since 
RTC holds most of the title and fee, and RTC could negotiate for those rights. The objections of only one property could significantly impact the trail project. Rail banking doesn't eliminate potential property owner claims. However, after rail banking, any property owner claims that allege that the trail is not permitted in the railroad easement would be directed to the federal government, which has a process for addressing their financial claims. Rail banking thereby provides protections to the RTC from potential financial liability associated with building an active transportation trail along rail easements in any configuration. Rail banking will facilitate trail construction on the whole of the branch rail line. It is important to note that the Sonoma Marin Area Rail Transportation, or SMART, did not rail bank freight and built a trail adjacent to their commuter rail service. SMART was recently sued by adjacent property owners for inverse condemnation. Rail banking would avoid it now. If RTC were to rail bank a portion of the line, RTC would be responsible for preserving the rail bank right away for future reactivation of freight rail. Preservation efforts allow for a trail, but one is not required. RTC could leave the rails in place. We could reconfigure the rail for rail with trail and continue planning for future passenger rail service. RTC could even choose to continue some freight service on the line while the line is rail bank. Prior to any advanced discussion on rail banking, RTC and St. Paul and Pacific Railroads reached out to Roaring Camp as a potential freight operator and successor to the ACL agreement. However, Roaring Camp had concerns about taking on any significant responsibilities for maintenance of the rail line. And I can understand why. As I know firsthand, the cost of owning and maintaining a 150-year-old rail line is extremely expensive. Therefore, at this time, staff believes that abandonment of the freight easement in association with termination of the ACL agreement and rail banking will eliminate ownership constraints related to RTC's use of railroad easements for a trail, eliminate, the duration, eliminate for the duration of rail banking the need to complete expensive repairs necessary for freight rail service only, deferring the need to divert discretionary funds from other projects or to implement a new dedicated local funding source to pay for the freight rail repairs, preserve the rail corridor in a manner that would provide local control and flexibility on decision-making, including possibilities for future commuter rail service with a trail, provide an avenue for the current rail operator to exit the ACL agreement, an agreement that St. Paul and Pacific Railroad, Roaring Camp, and RTC all find to not be financially viable. However, there are a number of other factors that the commission should consider in determining whether and how to pursue rail banking on the Santa Cruz Branch Rail Line. These issues include that the process of rail banking would require the filing with the Surface Transportation Board of an application or request for exemption or authority to abandon. That St. Paul and Pacific Railroad continues to hold the freight easement on the Santa Cruz Branch Rail Line and has chosen not to follow through with the filing of their notice of abandonment, even though St. Paul and Pacific Railroad still desires to terminate the ACL agreement and extinguish their ownership of freight of the freight easement. The Felton Line is also a freight rail line, and rail banking the Santa Cruz Branch Rail Line would effectively leave Roaring Camp's potential freight operations as a stranded segment. And finally, Roaring Camp has voiced opposition to rail banking the Santa Cruz, uh, the Santa Cruz Branch Rail Line, which is owned by RTC. But if an agreement with Roaring Camp and St. Paul and Pacific Railroad cannot be reached, it appears that RTC's only method of rail banking would be to file for what is called adverse abandonment and have the Federal Surface Transportation Board decide whether these two lines should remain part of the federal freight network. Adverse abandonment is a process when a person or entity that does not own the freight easement, and this would be RTC, files a request with the Surface Transportation Board 
to order to force the abandonment of freight services on a rail line. This process is typically initiated when there is no active freight service on a line and when the requesting party desires to have the freight line taken out of service so that the railroad right away can be used for purposes other than freight service, including rail banking. For the RTC to be able to rail bank the Santa Cruz branch rail line, Roaring Camp's objections must be addressed. RTC staff prefers to address Roaring Camp's concerns through negotiations and to reach an agreement with them in lieu of any potential future decision for future adverse abandonment. Although RTC could file for about, about, excuse me, adverse abandonment and rail bank, the uh, rail banking of the RTC owned Santa Cruz branch rail line, allowing Roaring Camp's objections to be settled as part of those potential proceedings, adverse abandonment and rail banking of the Santa Cruz branch rail line could be a long process due to their objections. Another potential legal approach would be for RTC to file for adverse abandonment of freight only on the Felton branch line as an initial step to rail banking the Santa Cruz branch rail line. A determination of abandonment of freight on the Felton line would be based on whether there are realistic expectations for profitable freight service on that line. As mentioned earlier, the STP does not regulate recreational rail, and the RTC would only be seeking to gain clarification as to whether the Felton line's current freight status can be used to stop rail banking on the Santa Cruz branch rail line. This action could potentially provide resolution of the stranded line argument in advance and separate of potential subsequent actions to abandon and rail bank the Santa Cruz branch rail line and terminate the ACL agreement. If the STB finds cause for abandonment, Roaring Camp could leave their rails in place and continue their recreational rail service, including the beach train. Roaring Camp could also choose to use their line for a fire break, which was a notable concern by the fire chiefs of the San Lorenzo Valley. Roaring Camp could rail bank their line if they wish to secure federal protections of property rights associated with any easements that they own, similar to what RTC is contemplating for the Santa Cruz branch rail line. RTC has no interest in having Roaring Camp remove their rails, nor does RTC desire to build a trail on the Felton branch rail, rail line. To reiterate, any adverse abandonment action is not the preference of RTC staff. Staff believes that a negotiated agreement with Boring Camp to address their concerns and due consideration of RTC's financial situation is preferred. However, staff understands that this is a complicated and difficult issue, which will require collaboration, and we seek solutions to complicated problems. To start, RTC has offered Roaring Camp a long-term lease of the portion of the Santa Cruz branch rail line that Roaring Camp uses to ensure that they can continue to run their recreational service to the boardwalk. RTC staff has also discussed the possibility with Roaring Camp of expanding recreational service to Davenport. Nonetheless, Roaring Camp still opposes rail banking. In all due respect to Roaring Camp, what railroad would want to be disconnected from the national rail network? Being disconnected can have implications and limitations for a railroad's ability to receive new equipment. In consideration, RTC has discussed financial considerations to help move equipment by truck if possible. However, those negotiations did not go very far and Roaring Camp has indicated they prefer the status quo over any attempt to rail bank the Santa Cruz branch rail line. Roaring Camp has been functionally disconnected from the main line since 2017. This situation has left two of their locomotives stuck in Watsonville and able to travel to Felton. RTC was hoping to have all repairs completed by now, so Roaring Camp could move their engines. Unfortunately, the Capitola and Seascapes trestles have been de deemed out of service and RTC has identified other costly repairs necessary to restore freight service, which RTC simply cannot currently afford and sees no realistic possibility of funding in the foreseeable future. RTC could just choose to leave the ACL agreement in place until its termination date, 
of 2028. However, doing so would not make it more likely that RTC will find funding and be able to complete necessary repairs and reconnect the lines. In the meantime, we are being challenged in developing other projects on the line. Project designs are restrict, restricted by the need to fully accommodate freight rail in the short term, even though the line is non-functional and RTC cannot afford the repairs. Property right issues for these projects are on the critical path to prepare for construction, so it will be necessary to understand whether we will need to acquire additional property rights fairly soon. We understand that more information is likely needed to understand the problem and assess our options. Staff is interested in hearing feedback and expects to be able to provide more information over the next several months. In the meantime, we remain interested in working with Warren Camp and St. Paul and Pacific Railroad to find a mutually agreeable solution that ensures the long-term su success of Roaring Camp while protecting the fiscal sustainability of the RTC and the taxpayer money that we are expected to manage in a responsible manner. I'm joined here today by Steve Mattis, RTC General Counsel, and Eric Hockey, RTC's Railway Counsel, who are available to answer legal questions associated with the abandonment and rail banking process. Madam Chair, that concludes my report, and I hand it back over to you for commissioner questions before taking a break and then opening it to public comment and commissioner discussion. Thank you, Director Preston. I will take this time to call on commissioners for questions only. Um, I know there's a tendency to move into the comment portion, but I th these are for clarifying questions, technical questions about this report. And um, I'm watching the hands go up from the public. We will take that break after questions, and I'm going to um, try to be uh, you know, an enforcer on the questions versus comments uh, <laughs> dynamic right now. Thank you. And uh, Commissioner Koenig, your, I see your hand. Thank you, Chair Brown. I appreciate the uh, emphasis on questions at the moment. Um, so first question, uh, Director Preston, will your comments be available online? Um, I know they are largely matched the staff report, but there were a few updates, I think, in response to some public comments, for example, um, you know, regarding use of uh, the, the, the line for fighting fires, et cetera. Um, and uh, it would be useful if it was posted as a, on an RTC web page with a PDF link. Um, but is that the intention? Um. It was not my intention. Um, we do make a video available. I can see about making a presentation version of my staff report available. All right, thank you. Don't, don't, um, we, post a, don't we post a video of every meeting at the end? The, the, so the videos are posted. Um, perhaps we could do something like a uh, notification about a timestamp for when this, uh, when this presentation began so for people who wanna find it if, if we don't pull it out entirely but yes it, you will have access yeah. all right yeah i mean there's just been uh, so much confusion and misinformation about this topic that i think the more we can do to help uh clarify before the public the better um you know i, I wanted to acknowledge the letter we received from roaring camp which really uh clearly outlined some of their concerns and um use the opportunity to to uh ask about a couple of those um the first is uh, you know, there is, Roaring Camp seems to be expressing the concern that rail banking the Felton line would expose Roaring Camp to lawsuits. Is there any reason uh, to, to believe that? I mean, my understanding based on your report is that actually rail banking uh, helps shield people, including the RTC and presumably Roaring Camp from lawsuits. But could you elaborate on that a little? Um, I only discussed the property rights issues. I would have to defer to Loring Camp um, or my legal counsel about potential lawsuits that they might um, experience. I, I would add to that, uh, Commissioner, that uh, we're not aware of the lawsuits that they would be identifying. Um, rail banking, we do not believe would expose them to that, but, but uh, we welcome Loring Camp's comments on that. Okay. Um, and then uh, last question, it seems like another big, um, you know, point of anxiety for Roaring Camp is this, the ability to get equipment 
uh, to the Felton site. Um, and, um, you know, we've discussed whether or not that's possible via truck. I'm just curious if uh, any more, and Roaring Camp seems to believe that it's not, uh, I've heard other reports that it, that it could be, uh, you know, does any of this work that we're doing on the highway and the, uh, on the bridges uh, impact that, uh, that at all? What, what research has been done, whether equipment could be moved by truck um, and if it's possible to get Roaring Camp their equipment that way? We would need to engage with Roaring Camp to understand the full specifications of their equipment and um, see what options exist. Um, you know, it's not easy to move a locomotive by truck. I certainly respect their concerns. Um, it's also not unprecedented to, to do so. I did discuss this a little bit with St. Paul and Pacific Railroad, and they said, yeah, we have moved um, locomotives by, by truck before. So. I think it would really depend. Um, there's some real issues associated with uh, uh, um, uh, overloads on bridges that they may have to travel over, um, uh, um, clearance issues um, for bridges that they would have to travel under, um, including the two rail bridges uh, on the Highway 1. Um, so more investigation would be needed to really make a determination on what could or could not be done. Okay, thank you. That's all my questions at this time. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Koenig. Uh, Commissioner Johnson, Randy Johnson, you're up. Thank you, Chair. I just had a quick question. In the event, however unlikely it might be, that you had passenger rail and also freight rail sharing the same track, does freight take precedence over passenger rail in terms of its ability to um, be the one that uh, is the primary user of the track? I'm gonna have our legal counsel, Eric Hawk, our railway counsel, Eric Hockey, um, comment on that. Um, Eric, if you would, don't mind. Um, Mr. Hockey, you're on mute. Sorry about that. I've been sitting so quietly so long. I, <laughs> um, it really depends on the type of passenger service as to what gets priority. Um, you know, on excursions, freight would take uh, priority over excursion traffic. If you have commuter rails, there can be different rules that apply um, as to who gets sort of the priority in terms of scheduling. Um, you know, Amtrak has a whole different scheduling. You know, we're not talking about that here, I don't think. Um, so, you know, it would be really up to um, the parties to determine priorities and, and how that would, you know, be worked. There's right now with um, there being basically uh, very little or no freight service, there would be no problem scheduling freight service around passenger service schedules. Thank you. Was that all from you, Commissioner Johnson? Questions? Okay, uh, Commissioner Schifrin, your turn. Just a few questions. I, I was a little unclear about the liability risks with and without abandonment. Could you clarify what they would be with abandonment and then without abandonment? Um, Guy, would you like me to start? Yeah, go, ahead, go ahead, Steve. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Schiffer, are you referring to the abandonment on the Santa Cruz branch line or the Felton branch line? Just wanna make sure I understand the question. Um, well, either one. Well, the one that we're, the one that we've done more analysis and are more familiar with um, again, based on the prior response that I gave, are the Santa Cruz branch line. And so the liability issues that, that RTC potentially faces are the liability issues associated with the uh, segments of the line on which they own easements versus a uh, fee interest in the property. And so the, the utilization of that portion of the line um, for, for instance, the trail, or other uses that were not anticipated in the easement uh, do create potential liabilities with regards to the um, whether or not RTC would have to essentially acquire additional property interest to be able to build the things that they would like to build within that right of way. 
So if there are live, the difference would be with, without abandonment, there's these liability risks with abandonment and rail banking, then those risks shift to the federal government. Is that the- That is correct. Yeah, that is correct. With rail banking, if rail banking were to occur on either of the segments, then the ability to place trails within the right of way is specifically authorized under federal law. And you're correct that the cost exposure does shift to the federal government pursuant to the Rails to Trails Act. My next question really has to do with what this easement liability might turn out to be. I appreciate the attachment three in our staff report that showed areas of the line that have easements, where there are easements. And I appreciate the response to my question that sort of has to follow up on that, that I sent privately in terms of the number of parcels that have, where there are easements. It wasn't clear how large those parcels are, but let me ask, right now there is a rail easement. So as long as the rail is potentially operable, the adjacent property owners cannot use the property. They could say that if the commission wants to do, put in a rail trail adjacent to it, that's not part of our right. So that would have to be purchased. But can you give any sense about how much it might cost to purchase an easement where the property owner can't use the property anyway? Well, we have not done any type of analysis of what the actual cost would be. We do have some indication of what the costs have been to acquire property up in the segment five issue, but we have not analyzed that. But your point, the other point as part of your question is correct, that an appraiser would look at the encumbrances that exist on the property in determining valuation. So a property that has a rail easement on it is arguably less valuable than one that does not have a rail easement on it. Right, and that was our situation on the North Coast, right, where we didn't even own the property. Correct, we actually were acquiring additional properties. Okay, my next question changes the subject somewhat, and it's to Guy. Would the construction of the proposed greenway require the removal of the tracks? For the greenway defined in the greenway initiative? Yes. It appears that it would require removal of the tracks. Thank you very much. My next question is to the chair, and it's really, I guess, a suggestion that maybe given that so much of this discussion concerns Roaring Camp, and there's been a question about what Roaring Camp position is, would it be possible if they wanted to give Roaring Camp more than a minute and a half to make their presentation? I think that would only be reasonable. Thank you, Commissioner Schifrin, for that request. I do think that's a good idea. I have been contemplating how to handle that because I don't want to put Roaring Camp on the spot, but since we are taking a break before we go to comment, put it out there, and I can't scroll through and see exactly who's here while I'm chairing. So if a representative of Roaring Camp is here, Melanie Clark or someone from the board, and wants to address us, I will give you some additional time, and we can start with you when we come back. For everybody else, I want to take this opportunity for a break. I think five minutes seems a little light for the amount of time we're going to spend in this meeting today, so I think maybe 10 minutes. We'll take that break and come back at 12.15, and so folks who are interested in speaking, please be prepared, get your hands up, and it's going to be one and a half minutes, but we will start with a representative from Roaring Camp if you'd like to 
provide your perspective and address any of the issues that have come up thus far. Okay, um, I see Commissioner Quinn, you have your hand up. Do you have a question or are you um, wanting to respond to something you've heard? I'd, I'd like to get- No, a I had a quick question. A sure. quick follow Go sure. for it. A quick question follow up uh, to Commissioner, to uh, Executive Director Preston. Uh, we've heard a lot about removing the rails. Is there any scenario in which the rails as they currently exist would be viable for future use? There are sections of the rail line that could be um, viable for future use. Um, you know, going back, you know, certainly for freight rail, um, it is. Um, we did identify a good portion of the rail that would need to be reconstructed for commuter rail. Um, uh, commuter rail has uh, different standards. We'd be looking at operating at higher speeds. Um, um, we would want to really do uh, an analysis of the vertical and horizontal alignment of, of the rail line to determine um, where it should be. So for commuter rail, I would say we would be reconstructing a good portion of the rail line. For freight rail, um, you know, a good portion of the rail line would be usable. Um, the, the issue is more um, the bridges, culverts, uh, uh, drainage issues, uh, slides and slip outs that we've experienced on the rail line. We have some sinkholes. Um, um, so, but, but that's different than the, the track. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I'm going to now, um, I, I'm going to send us to into a break time and 12.15 um, is no longer 10 minutes. So I'm just going to say let's, we'll be back at 12.20. Gives you a little over 10 minutes. Commissioners, you will have an opportunity to ask questions again. We will bring it back around to you. So um, let's take this break and uh, come back prepared to be attentive to the community. Thank you all.
Okay, welcome back, everyone. If you're here, please turn your cameras back on so we know that commissioners are ready for our public comment portion of uh, the, I, this next item on our agenda. This is item 22, as a reminder. And we've received uh, an oral report as well as a written report in our packet. Uh, and I'm now going to open the uh, comment period up. Uh, please raise your hand if you are interested in speaking on this item. I also want to remind uh, the public that this is an informational item as it's been presented to us today and um, that we will um, take that public comment with the understanding that the, the commission will not be acting. Uh, I do see Commissioner McPherson's hand up, and so I wanted to give you an opportunity to speak uh, <laughs> before we go into public comment. Yeah, in the interest, I know that I have, and each of you has received hundreds, maybe thousands of emails, um, and I just want to Thank uh, everyone for their interest in this. I can understand it fully. Um, I, I just like to begin by repeating concerns I expressed at this week's uh, Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors meeting. Just previously from some of our commissioners now, some questions have been asked that I was interested in as well. But frankly, I'm, I'm really disappointed that after all these years of study and discussion, we continue to have such deeply entrenched factions on how best to use the corridor. Uh, this divisiveness has done nothing to solve the undermining fundamental issue of how best to move to a larger, uh, the large number of communities between Santa Cruz County and the North County. Um, and that goes on every day, every weekday for sure. Uh, and there are core social justice, economic and climate issues we are supposed to be solving through this process, which really get lost in the debate. And what we need to do is continue to gather as much information as possible in order to make informed decisions. And I thought the outline by our guy Preston was excellent today. And today's item was placed on the agenda so we could openly review the possibilities that have been discussed in closed session last September. Uh, after the current operator made it clear that they wanted to exit the car, their contract with RTC, we really have a fiduciary obligation to investigate all of the possible options regarding the rail line. And this will be the third operator who wants to exit their contract because they are not able to make financial, uh, make financial, uh, make it, make freight, freight service financially viable on the rail line. That's a fact. That's why we're into this situation because they don't want to do it. They can't afford to do it. We need the public to understand how, to, how complex these options are. And we need to partner together to meet mobility needs of all county residents, especially South County residents, as has been stated. So in the coming months, much more information will be coming forward that we hopefully can get community talking to one another rather than what we have been doing for the several years now, which is talking past one another. Because of um, the election requirements, Santa Cruz County voters are scheduled to vote and weigh in on the Greenway ballot measure on June 7th. Environmental impact reports for three segments of our rail corridor with all options scoped and financial impact identified will be presented in that course of, of discussion, I believe, before the election. But in the meantime, we need to have a better, more disciplined discussion regarding the financial reality of continuing with freight service along the corridor. People say that we have the money to do it, but as uh, um, our guy Preston had mentioned, uh, we only have so much money coming in from Measure D and the rail line or corridor is getting 8% of that or $2 million a year. That's far short, far short of what we need to do to really do anything uh, substantial on that rail line. In fact, I'd like to see a market analysis conducted on that topic, both from the uh, Regional Transportation Commission 
and from our current provider, Rory Camp. And I'd like to reiterate that at no time have I ever heard from a commissioner or staff say that they want to do anything that would diminish the financial uh, success of Roaring Camp. Nobody has. If in fact there is a direct connection between the impact of determining the future of freight and the future of passion to rail service, I would like that to be clarified. The letter submitted by Roaring Camp brings up some interesting points and questions, and I know we're going to hear more from them that I also would like to see clarified. And I'd like to make a motion to that effect that we have some more information from both parties, if you will, RTC and Roaring Camp, so we can really get to some factual, legitimate um, criteria rather than uh, what we've been experiencing for the last two or three years. Uh, we've got to change the course of discussion on this and gets more civil about it. So that's my basic comments. And I, I understand and I appreciate the questions that were asked previously. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner McPherson. Uh, I um, wholeheartedly agree. Uh, uh, and uh, thank you for the reminder about, uh, just for, for everybody who's weighing in here on um, how we frame our, our comments and our perspectives recognizing the very strong feelings uh, around this issue uh, that we um, stay on task and 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 treat each other respectfully and recognize that we are all uh, you know in this to uh, support a viable sustainable transit and transportation infrastructure and services for our community and um, so with that I will, uh, open up to the public, and uh, beginning with um, Kyle Kelly. Wait, excuse me, Chair yes. Brown. Uh, yes. You had asked whether there were representatives from Roaring Camp. Oh, I'm sorry. I did. I'm so sorry. Yeah, I did do. <laughs> I did do that. I didn't see a hand up, so I'm gonna. Um, there are two uh, individuals representing Roaring Camp that would like to speak. Okay. Uh, Rosemary Sarka and Michael Conran. Okay, so those, those they are here. Gotcha. Okay, so we will um, start with uh, Michael Connoran. I see your name here, and then and Rosemary, uh, and I'll give you uh, um, about let's see if three minutes to to talk with us. If if you need more time, then um, I'm happy to give that. But I do want to keep us moving. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, Michael Connoran, I'll call on you. Hi, uh, I'm Michael Connor and uh, representing uh, Roaring Camp. Uh, uh, I was actually pleased to hear uh, the executive director's uh, comments this morning. I think he went out of his way uh, to present things in a, in a neutral manner and uh, try to inform the public. Let me just give you a couple of the concerns, the main concerns of Roaring Camp. I think the first one is really the loss of uh, the protection that, that a rail carrier has from being uh, in the federal jurisdiction. Uh, I know uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, Director Koenig asked about lawsuits. That, it's not really lawsuits. The concern is it's really with the protection of the federal jurisdiction. And uh, I'm a yeah, very qualified counsel, Mr. Hockey. I'm sure he can explain that to you uh, if you have additional questions. Um, uh, the main issue, I think, really for us is the economic viability of, of, the, of the beach train uh, and the ability to get uh, rail equipment into Santa Cruz, uh, given the limited clearances of many of the bridges. Um, we raised this with the commission uh, a long time ago. Uh, I think it would be helpful for us to have additional uh, discussions about that and perhaps to uh, explore that further. Uh, you know, we're the business whose who's viability is being threatened. And so um, I think it would be, you know, I think it's incumbent upon the commission to uh, help work with us to try to see if there's a viable way to resolve this. Um, but also, I think we feel there is a viable, we, at least th that there's a viable chance for, for rail. Uh, we'd like to explore additional uh, freight options. We have had expressions of interest from potential freight carriers uh, that potentially could make this a viable uh, uh, line. Uh, we have submitted uh, uh, questions and comments to the commission 
staff regarding negotiating uh, an alternative to the ACL. Uh, it's our view that those negotiations were never fully pursued. Um, so I'd be happy to enter into additional talks with them. Um, I, I think from the perspective of Brian Camp, there's just been so many changes here. This line was bought with the anticipation that it would be that the Santa Cruz line would be kept open. Uh, the Roaring Camp gave up a right of first refusal when the, the commission first bought the line. Uh, and uh, we've really had sort of a decreasing uh, interest uh, enthusiasm on the behalf of the commission. Uh, there's some understandable reasons for that, but it does really cause a disruption to our, uh, our investment and our expectations. Um, uh, finally, I, I just want to note, you know, there is an important, uh, something to just a historical note in terms of uti utilizing the line for for uh, for emergencies, uh, 1906, San Francisco uh, really relied on Southern Pacific Railroad to assist them with rebuilding the city. Uh, so there is some historic precedent. Finally, the real concern with the Aptus project is that those the cost of uh, taking away those bridges and having to replace them again uh, is going to be prohibited and basically end the the history the chance for rail service in, in, in on this line. Thank you. Thank you. So we I'll now call on uh, Rosemary Sarka to provide additional comments from the from Roaring Camp. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, thank you. Um, I I do want to take a moment to clarify that um, Roaring Camp did not uh, reject an offer to uh, take on the ACL. Um, we were approached by uh, RTC and we, our response was that we would prefer to discuss some of these details uh, more clearly. And uh, we did not get a response back from that. And I do understand that there are many reasons for that right now, but we did not reject that offer. Um, I will restate some of the things that uh, Michael Connoran said. Uh, we need our equipment. We, if we don't get a chance to replenish equipment, the company will die. Uh, there was not an opportunity otherwise to bring in equipment. And our loss of federal protection uh, is a, our safety net. That's what we have counted on. That's what we were promised. Without federal protection, we are at the mercy of whatever uh, agreement that we wish to get or we could get from the county. And that is obviously not sufficient given the fact that we are now in this situation of being told that what we were offered before is being withdrawn. Uh, and we also think that freight service is very much possible, and we have looked into that. Our, our passion for this stems from much more than our personal advantage or disadvantage. And we know that if we lose these protections, the whole branch line is in jeopardy. Um, that is one of our strongest motivating factors. It affects us, but it affects all of us. We are the first domino to fall. Um, and we're very, very concerned about that. Thank you, that's all. Thank you, Ms. Sarka. So I will now uh, take it out to the general public and back to uh, our first speaker uh, that is Kyle Kelly. Kyle Kelly, uh, you're up. And we will be um, just due to the nature of the, the high level of interest and the length of the meeting, uh, we will have one and a half minutes for comment. Greetings, Chair Brown, Vice Chair Koenig, Commissioners, and RTC staff. I'm Kyle Kelly. I serve on the City of Santa Cruz's uh, Transportation and Public Works Commission. I speak to you now as an individual, a parent, a taxpayer, and an advocate for inclusive communities. It was only three years ago, on March 8, 2019, 
that the Santa Cruz RTC wrote a letter to the California Transportation Commission stating their obligations under state law requiring Proposition 116 bond funds to be used for A, inner city passenger rail projects connecting the city of Santa Cruz with the Watsonville Junction, or B, other rail projects within Santa Cruz County which facilitate recreational commuter inner city and inner county travel. In the letter, your executive director, Guy Preston, unequivocally stated, begin quote, the RTC is committed to meeting the requirements set by Proposition 116 and CTC resolutions. The RTC and shortline operators have made significant repairs and upgrades to railroad infrastructure. And Santa Cruz County voters approved Measure D in 2016, which includes funds for rail line maintenance and repairs. Since that time, the RTC has evaluated service options for public transit service in the corridor, including potential station locations, costs, ridership projections, and schedules. I'm going to skip forward because I realize I'm out of time and thought I had two minutes. The RTC board unanimously affirmed its commitment to leave the railroad infrastructure in place, maintain freight rail service, and institute high capacity public transit service, end quote. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. And apologies for the shortened time. We are we have a lot of people who want to speak. Uh, the next person on the list here is Gina Cole. Ms. Cole, you're up. Okay. How about I, now? There you go. We can hear you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Gina Cole, and I am a resident of Watsonville. Um, regarding the inconsistency with regional transportation policy, taking action to abandon and rail bank our rail corridors will directly conflict um, with all plans and policies adopted by this commission, with plans and policies adopted by other regional and state agencies, with resolutions adopted by this commission, and with tax measures and ordinances approved by a healthy majority of local voters. Measure, um, sorry, misleading statements and words. The connections between the FBRL and the SCBRL, between freight and passenger rail, and the multiple potential uses of the same infrastructure are complex. Some public statements from members of your staff and other commissioners mislead the public into thinking it's a simple matter to just reject a freight line while claiming to support passenger rail in the sometime distant future versus via rail banking. Commissioners and others now are copied too often by local media, further spreading intentional or unintentional misinformation. Technically, heavy call haul freight refers to truck and rail freight uh, that exceeds allowable limits and requires special permitting. There is absolutely no evidence that excessive weight freight weights have ever been carried on. Okay, um, so Ms. Cole, if uh, I apologize, we are uh, going to keep to the schedule here. If you want to send us any additional comments, uh, we are receiving them and we'll uh, take them into account. Okay, David Dates, you're up. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Okay, yeah, members of the commission and, and really to the public, I, I'm kind of dismayed by the level of uh, campaign misinformation and even conspiracy theories coming from Friends of the Rail Trail and Roaring Camp. Um, you know, they're calling it uh, rail banking or the conversation of rail banking a dastardly act uh, fueled by special interests. And it's completely unfounded, uh, as as Guy Preston's report, you know, is, is telling us this is a necessary step to preserving our rail corridor. And I'm sorry that you guys are getting the brunt of this misinformation campaign campaign through these robot emails. You know, click here, sign here, and shoot an email to 20 people's personal and professional email addresses. This has got to stop. Uh, and I think it really steps. It really starts with bringing this issue to a, a countywide vote and uh, and really stripping friends of the rail trail 
of this, you know, of this talking point that they are operating through a community consensus that we have all agreed to commuter rail and we have to sink more costs. This is the, uh, their, 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 their primary argument is the sunken cost fallacy that we've continued this mistake for so long that we must continue to pour money into it. And I think the, the Regional Transportation Commission and staff, I think they finally realized that this is not viable and I appreciate your efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I, um, as I said previously, I, I just want to remind uh, commenters that we are trying to stick to the item at hand. I know there are a lot of related issues and concerns and perspectives that come up for, for folks as we consider this item and related items. Um, but I would ask folks to please speak directly to the item and the commission's role. We are at an RTC meeting and uh, debating campaign talking points and um, you know other issues related to a broader public campaign uh, about an item that will go to the voters is, um, this is not the place for that. So um, please speak to the, the item at hand and um, just, uh, just, just wanted to remind everybody what, what we're here for, okay? Uh, Jack Brown, you're you're up next. Thank you, Commissioner Brown. And to be clear to alternate Commissioner Schifrin, I am Jack Brown and I'm speaking as a resident of Aptos. Thank you, Executive Director Guy Preston for the very thorough, honest, and informative report and Commissioner McPherson and his remarks regarding public comments. I agree with the report wholeheartedly. I believe everything on this topic comes down to being realistic about freight. No one wants Roaring Camp and its tourist train to go away, but saying that there's freight business going on or any possible realistic freight movement isn't close to being financially viable. It really comes down to where we want to spend our limited transportation funds. When someone earlier noted evacuations, it reminded me of something that actually happened last weekend. I was leaving our home to pick up dinner at one of our favorite outhouse restaurants. I was driving down Cliff Drive in Rio del Mar when an ambulance pulled in front of me, taking one of my neighbors to the hospital. The ambulance was only able to travel down our main road at about 15 miles an hour because of the state of disrepair of the road. Even at low speeds, our poor neighbor was still being jostled around in the back of the ambulance. Our roads are in dire need of maintenance. I hate to see funds diverted for a freight maintenance for freight business beyond Watsonville that simply does not exist. Please, Roaring Camp, come to the table, work with the commission and freight rail bank so we can use our precious transportation funds on viable public transit alternative transit and maintaining our roads. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, David Schonbrunn, you're up. And you're gonna to wanna to press star six, there you go. Thank you, I'm David Schonbrunn, president of the Train Riders Association of California. We were among the creators of Prop 116 which enabled the purchase of the branch line. We do not consider this agenda item to be consistent with the Prop 116 grant. The effort of a few to kill passenger rail service is a direct attack on the county's future sustainability. Here's the part the rail opponents don't understand. Traffic in your county is gonna continue to get worse. More people equals more cars. Are you willing to sacrifice the future in your county so that a few people don't have trains running near their backyards? I know a lot about rail banking. The staff report completely garbled the subject. It's backwards. Contrary to the staff report, rail banking opens the door to litigation. Our organization has been very involved with the STB. We will file an opposition at the STB if you attempt adverse abandonment on either branch line here today. Thank you. Excuse me, and thank you, Mr. Schoenbrunn. Uh, a reminder that no action is anticipated today. Uh, we do thank you for your comments. And uh, next up, we have Brian from TrailNow. Hi, it's Brian from TrailNow. Let's 
count on uh, Guy Preston, the expert in legal counsel to move forward. Let's enable him to rail bank. He knows what to do. Um, it's a day-to-day -day slip on opening the coastal corridor until we the rail bank. Roaring Camp will likely lose access over Highway 1 and Highway 9 because of freight loss. They can't drive an amusement park train over those highways. That's a Caltrans decision, and it is a fact. Trail, and, and obviously nobody wants Roaring Camp to lose out. The great community business. But let's us Trail Now has actually offered a proposed plan where a new Roaring Camp Boardwalk Park is established and e-trolleys from the boardwalk to Felton along the Felton line would be created. That would open up new transportation for Metro on the Felton line, as well as a trail to Felton. So let's work with Roaring Camp. Let's enable them. Let's make give them money. Give them some money, make them successful. But Roaring Camp, please come to the table. We believe there is an alternative to it. And we understand what your issue is in the way of compliance to railroads going over highways. Not good. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Peoples. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to keep doing this um, as we move through. Um, just a reminder, again, uh, this is a Regional Transportation Commission meeting. The commissioners are trying to understand where the public is at and what the issues are related to this very, very complicated um, question. And so uh, please direct your comments to the commission. Um, and you all know, I, I'm quite sure how to communicate with each other, um, the, the various stakeholders uh, out in the community. So um, again, this is commission uh, uh, information uh, day. And so I'll, I'll just ask folks to, to stick with uh, addressing us and, and what you think the commission ought to do. Uh, okay, so next up we have Linda wills Hewson. Thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioners. I'm Linda wills Susan, former Executive Director of the RTC from 1985 to 2005. Yesterday, I was talking to a friend and trying to explain some of the arcane details about what's going on with the rail and trail. And at one point, they said to me, so do I get this right? Some people think that rail banking is needed to solve the problems that rail banking itself creates. Well, yeah. Unfortunately, that's right. It's rail banking itself that would create the problems we need to solve by rail banking. Rail banking is not like your savings account at the bank where you can put your dollars in when you have them and take them back out when you need them. Unlike your savings account, rail banking is a way to permanently convert rail lines to exclusive rail use. Rail banking is a way to use federal tax dollars to pay a few current property owners who now own property that previous owners over 30, 130 years ago allowed the railroad to use to pay these current few property owners for the right to use their property only as a trail. Rail banking is a dead end. Thank you, Ms. wills -Husen. Our next speaker is David Dean. Oh, yes, thank you for your time. Um, I um, am very disappointed that the public is very dismissive of freight. And in fact, even Director Preston said that there's no viable freight. However, if I could uh, refer you to the 2045 transportation plan where they said that in 2012, for, uh, rail freight was 5% by volume of all the freight coming through our county. Also in that same document, figure 3.15 um, states what the tr daily truck volume is on our highways. Highway 1 has 5,220 trucks. 5% 5 of that converted to rail would be 26 rail cars per day. That's not tiny. Um, Highway 9 for the Felton branch is uh, 1,785 uh, 
trucks per day. That would be about 10 rail cars per day. Um, there absolutely is um, interest in freight and, uh, the, uh, and prospects for freight. And that is tens of thousands of tons of carbon from our atmosphere per year. That would be fantastic to have uh, for our community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dean. Uh, our next speaker is Jacob Wisotsky. I got that right. And go for it. Very good job on my name. Mr. Wazaki, I think you may be breaking up a little bit. We're not able to hear you. I think we've lost him. Internet connectivity. Uh, okay, so if uh, Mr. Wazaki returns, we'll get you back in the queue. Uh, and so next up, we have Jim, Jim Harville. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Brown, uh, Commissioners. Uh, Jim Harville, President of Placerville and Sacramento Valley Railroad, current home of, Sac of uh, Santa Cruz Portland Cement Number 2, the Chigan Locomotive. Uh, our, the line in which we operate is the uh, uh, one of the first, if not the first, rail banked corridor in the United States. Uh, I was uh, uh, pleased to hear the comments of David Schoenbrunn and Melinda Wilshusen about the uh, pitfalls of rail banking and their point that, uh, uh, which is the point that uh, I may wish to comment on, uh, is that rail banking does not protect you in easements. All right, we spent seven years uh, wrangling that out over here. And uh, if it is an easement, rail banking will expose you to that litigation, and it does not transfer that responsibility fully and completely to the federal government. But what it does do is force you into an imminent domain proceeding. So uh, I, I uh, hope to uh, be able to contribute further to this, this discussion. I do feel that the ACL uh, does need to be renegotiated to make it viable for any potential freight operator and uh, 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 you know, look, look forward. I wanna compliment uh, uh, staff on the job they've done so far. Thank you, Mr. Harville. Uh, our next speaker is Brad Wilson with Agron. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right. Well, just want to start off by saying, you know, I, I hope the commission supports um, the the you know rail freight and do not rip up any any track trackage that that is not good. Um, support Roaring Camp and all they can do. You know, when we bought the facility in in Watsonville in two thousand seven, we were told that we would always have um, freight being able to go to that facility and and uh, any talks of of it being removed or shut down or slowed down is bad like i said earlier we're it looks like we're going to be taking forward between 40 and 80 rail cars a month into into watsonville um, and that's to that's to bring in low carbon fuel and i know a lot of people are all cracked up on electric um, but just remember, biodiesel is here and it's now, it's helping California meet its low carbon fuel standards and reduce carbon. And, uh, you know, this electric, if you think you have brownout problems now, just wait till uh, the infrastructure needs to be put in place to try to supply all this, these e-vehicles that you keep talking about. We are here, we're now, let biodiesel do its thing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I I want to, I see that Mr. Uh, Jacob Wasaki, hope I'm pronouncing that right, uh, is back on. So I'll um, just move you back up to the front of the queue since you were already speaking. If you're ready, uh, now is your opportunity. 
uh, to address us. And I think we have, and there we go. Mr. Wasaki, if you're ready, uh, it's your turn. And I see you're on unmute, but I, we can't hear you. It does appear that your uh, the, the star nine is is or star six is working, but we still can't hear you. I'm I'm sorry about this. Okay, um, so we I, I apologize for the challenges here. Um, we'll try to get back around to you, Mr. Wasaki, if you can work on your your uh, volume, your your microphone. Uh, next up, we have Lonnie Faulkner. Hi, thank you. I would suggest to one commissioner that adverse abandonment in itself is not a civil action. Uh, Equity Transit urges the commission to immediately cease any further consideration of adverse abandonment of the Felton branch line and abandonment or rail banking of the Santa Cruz branch line as these actions are unnecessary and an unethical attack on a successful local family owned business and our county's future. Roaring Camp has been owned by the same family since 1963. That's 59 years. Georgiana Clark was a community-minded, well-respected woman of color who left the business to her daughters when she passed. And Milani Clark, Georgiana's daughter, now runs the business. Everyone who works for Roaring Camp feels that they are a part of a family, not just a part of a business's bottom line. Roaring Camp relinquished their first right of refusal in purchasing the tracks so the RTC could bring passenger rail to our community. And I paraphrase Milani. My family was assured the rail line was an extremely important asset to the county and that the RTC had worked hard to line up funding from the state and that the sale to the RTC was for the benefit of the entire community. The RTC assured Roaring Camp that the line would be used for rail thanks to funding from Pop Proposition 116, which specifically calls for a commitment to rail service. In response to Roaring Camp cleared the way for the RTC to purchase the line, and now the RTC is targeting Roaring Camp's Felton branch line as a first step towards forced abandonment of the full Santa Cruz branch line. Thank you, Ms. Faulkner. I will now call on Barry Scott. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. I, uh, you know, for Warren Camp, the federal freight easement is the is the one greatest protection against short-sighted local decisions, and I don't blame them for not giving it up. But it's also what protects our entire branch line from short-sighted decisions. I want to say that yesterday I had a 30-minute meeting with Mark Stone, and he and he he twice I think he said. If you lift the tracks, even part of them, they never come back. We need to understand this. There's uh, a lot has been said about a lack of freight interest. Well, look, we had the damage in 2017, the contract to progressive in 2018, and we haven't done any repairs. Now we're saying, oh my gosh, there's no freight. Well, no wonder. Maybe we need more time for funding, but we mustn't remove the rail line or rail bank, which is an irreversible process, sorry to say, and it conflicts with every prior R RTC decision and study. Rail banking is a hostile action for both freight and passenger operations in the future. You don't have to make transit happen today, but you sure don't have to destroy it. You don't have to destroy the rail line or, or, or the chances for our using that rail line either. Keep it intact, keep it viable, and reaffirm your commitment to leave the infrastructure in place and maintain Great Rail Service and Institute High Capacity Public Transit per your letter to the CTC in March 8, 2019. Thank you, Mr. Scott. Uh, it is our next speaker is Colin Miller. Hello. Um, hey. So I've lived in the San Lorenzo Valley for 20 years. Um, 
the roaring camp has always been a major component um, of what uh, offers some uh, culture and identity and it helps the economy. And it seems kind of seems kind of weird that basically it's uh, we can't can't maintain a, a system, so let's tear out and put in a new one. So I don't know. It it, it just seems a little rushed. The uh, the commuter train uh, obviously Roaring Camp can carry people. It it brings lots of people in and out of Santa Cruz, lowering traffic. Um, I mean, basically tearing out the track and say, well, we can put new ones later, but now we have money. Uh, maybe we don't have money. Um, so, I mean, sorry, I'm, I'm not more prepared for this. Um, I'm just looking at what I've heard on this meeting and it seems kind of a, a, a little bit of a red herring. So, well, thanks for listening though. Thank you, Mr. Miller. It's it's understandable. One can prepare substantially and still feel unprepared. This is very complex. Thank you for uh, weighing in. Our next speaker is Stacy. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. The. We have voted on this um, multiple times before. I don't see why the RTC is taking an action which uh, violates the will of the people. I moved to Santa Cruz 25 years ago and lived along the line in Sopel and watched the freight trains roll through with no, it, it, no interruption to, to people's lives with how quiet and we're talking about uh, adding electric trains and how would we do that if we don't finish what we already voted to do thank you thank you our next speaker is sally for rail and trail hi well um <laughs> You're not going to be surprised. Friends of the Rail and Trail urges the commission to immediately stop considering adverse abandonment of the Felton branch line or any or the Santa Cruz branch line either. As you can see from the public outcry, even attempting this action is causing community distress. It creates economic uncertainty and it destroys public trust in our institutions. And frankly, the negative ad impacts of adverse abandonment are not well understood and moving forward right now would be a mistake. We urge the commission to table this item for now, direct the staff to fully explore and analyze all the alternatives to abandonment and rail banking on the corridor, including just proceed with the plan of record as described in the Monterey Bay Scenic Sanctuary Trail Master Plan. On the 25th of January, Fort sent a letter a list of questions about rail banking to the RTC, and those questions really uh, need thorough and complete responses, as well as input from the public before this commission can consider itself well-informed enough to properly consider any abandonment of any kind. Lastly, the, you know, the law may allow the commission to conduct votes on this matter in closed session, but it does not require this to be dealt with in closed session. We appreciate that it got brought out into the public for today, and we hope that the, the large public outcry against this proposal will be enough to convince our public servants to drop it. But if you don't, any further work on this project should be done in plain view of the public. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. Okay, our next speaker is David Loves Public Transit. Uh, hello, can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. Hi, this is David Van Brink. Uh, good afternoon. I, I hope we're all of us enjoying this Robert Wilson scale operatic meeting today. Uh, and I guess this is only the second act. So look, I, I totally appreciate that the SCC RTC staff and director and commissioners are considering all the various interlocking economic, uh, temporal and legal moving parts and how they interact. It's, it's darned complex and I wish I wasn't paying attention. It, it seems to me that because there are opportunists quite eager to permanently remove the railroad entirely, it complicates what could otherwise be pragmatic conversations conducted in good faith. That's all. 
This could be straightforward, but for the anti-rail opportunists. Uh, good afternoon, that's all folks. Thank you, Mr. Van Brink. Our next speaker is Tina Andreotta. Hello there. Hi, hello. Hi. Um, firstly, um, there is no need to real ba rail bank the corridor to finish building the now under construction rail trail. The approved master plan calls for the trail to be built as a rail with trail facility because rails with trails avoids the problems associated with abandonment and rail banking. Rails with trails are the fastest growing type of rail trail across the US. According to the National Rails to Trails Conservancy, the number of rails with trails in the US increased from a total of 162 in September of 2013 to a total of 399 in January of 2021, a phenomenal increase of 250% in a little more than seven years. There are many reasons for this rapid growth, but they all boil down to this. It simply works the best. Best ways to stay on course, specifically with the uh, Monterey Bay Scenic Sanctuary Trail Master Plan from 2014, stop this nonsense about abandoning and rail banking our irreplaceable rail lines. Keep the trail and rail moving forward. Thank you. Rail banking is a dead end. Thank you, Ms. Andreata. Our next speaker is David Dean. I think I already had a turn. I think you sorry. already did. I, I was. I know you did speak before, and I, I was trying to track if it was the last item. And yes, you did. So, um, sorry. <laughs> We're going to carry on. <laughs> Thanks for for reminding me. Okay. Uh, our next speaker will be Patrick Wiseman. Mr. Wiseman, you want to hit uh, star six to unmute yourself. Because we can't hear you. And you're still on mute. If you hit star six, We'll be able to hear you. Or we should be able to hear you. Mr. Wiseman, I, th I think there may be an issue with your microphone, possibly. Um, so if, if you can figure that out, uh, we'll, we'll make sure to Britt, come back around and call on you. Uh, and now uh, we will try th third time's a charm, Jacob Wisaki. Uh, can you hear me this time? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. New device. Sorry, I apologize to everybody. Um, as a first district, district resident, I strongly oppose adverse abandonment of the Felton Branch Line, and I have some major concerns about this report. While the community is struggling to comprehend this issue through the fog of both intentional and unintentional misinformation, this report describes some purported benefits of rail banking while presenting minimal information on the Surface Transportation Board's decision-making process in these cases and proposes at least one action that in the past has been deemed an abuse of STP processes detailed in my written comments. Commissioners need to understand the expense, length, and likely futility of an adverse abandonment case. Long before RTC staff began preparing reports to help commissioners figure out what rail banking is, Roaring Camp went down, went down the list of surface transportation board uh, items that will be used to weigh the public inconvenience and necessity of adverse abandonment and checked every box that will be considered in their favor. I understand some community members may feel frustrated that local concerns or even a public vote can be preempted by federal law. However, we should remember that this federal body of law preserves a continuous network of rail that delivers goods and also passengers across the country without being threatened by undue interference from local interests that would just prefer not to have a noisy train in their community. 
I support Roaring Camp in protecting their property rights with all available legal tools and form the RTC to avoid this destructive, pointless, duplicitous course of action. Thank you, Mr. Wasaki, Wysaki, Wysaki. Um, uh, we Our next speaker is John E. Good day, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. I understand no decisions are being made today and it's just information gathering. So in the spirit of information gathering, I would just like to point out that uh, once the rails come up, they will never go back down. That is 100% certain. So uh, just be aware of this. An example is Dumbarton Bridge across lower San Francisco Bay. Dumbarton Bridge has not had any rail traffic since 1989 but they still keep the rails in place just in case, just in case they wanna use it at a later date. The Southern Pacific Railroad, now the Union Pacific Railroad, the largest railroad in America, understands this very well. Should they pull up the rails, they will never go back down. So they have kept these rails in place since 1989, just in case. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our uh, our next speaker is Charles Hicks. Yes, hello, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, yes, I, I would just like to uh, say two things. One, the first one is that I have always believed in compromise and it seems to me there's a, a lot of people in our community who would like to have a trail. A lot of people would like to continue to have could keep the rail. And it seems like having a rail on a trail is the perfect compromise. Not everyone is totally happy with it, but it's a good compromise. And it just seems like that's the kind of thing we need to do in our community. The second thing I wanted, uh, one of the commissioners brought up a question and that is how much of the line is fee simple? In other words, uh, this pressure seems like that's coming down on us right now. We gotta do something real quick because um, we're going to get sued by the landowners and so forth. I, why couldn't we just go and either renegotiate the lease on that part of the land that um, where we might uh, have trouble, or uh, just buy it and commit, you know, make it fee simple? Anyway, that's just a question I had. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hicks. I see one hand up, and this is uh, Mr. Weisman, Patrick Weisman who um, it looks like your uh, audio is fixed. So, uh, and more hands coming up. I do wanna just encourage folks, if you are interested in speaking on this issue, please raise your hands now. So we are aware of how many people uh, we anticipate. And um, I'll, with that, I'll call on Mr. Weissman. Thank you very much. Can you hear me now? We can. All right, thank you. Uh, rail digging is a mistake. Abandonment of any existing rail line in Santa Cruz is a mistake. Attacking Roaring Camp and offering them lousy compromises is appalling. Also, discussing the risk of easement violations and shifting our dirty work to the federal government is appalling. Roaring Camp needs equipment shipped by rail because their business serves the community directly. They need equipment shipped by rail. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much all I have to say. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker will be Christina Lofranco. Hi there, can you hear me? We can. Hi, I'm Christina Lofranco, a fifth generation Santa Cruzian, born at Dominican Hospital and raised in Felton, California. I now live in Santa Cruz proper. And growing up in Felton, my twin sister and I had season passes for the train. We would ride our bikes down to Roaring Camp. The conductor would load our bikes onto the train. <clears throat> and through the Redwoods, we would go down to Santa Cruz. And it was our outlet to a bigger life. It was how we were able to safely get to Santa Cruz as kids and explore what Santa Cruz had to offer. And as we grew as Felton kids with this link to beach life, we would sign up for junior guards down at Cowles. Being raised by a single mom, it was the only way <clears throat> we were able to get home from junior guards. Mom would drop us off before work 
and the Roaring Camp train would take us home after junior guards. And as an adult, grown now living in Santa Cruz, I take the train back home to Felton to visit my family. The hour-long ride enables me to center and ground myself, to slow down and root to my roots, and I love it. The train was and still is the only safe, accessible, and open to the public way to get from Felton to Santa Cruz. My hope is that whoever is the younger version of me and my twin sister, those grassroots Felton kids of today and tomorrow, can still enjoy the opportunities that we have. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Deborah Still. All right, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. So I mostly have a question. I'm just wondering, um, in considering the Santa Cruz branch line uh, abandonment, uh, whether that procedure would be done through an agreement with the ACL, I think that's who's doing the freight, or whether that would also be an adverse abandonment. Um, that's mostly, that's my main question. I think um, in general, I certainly support keeping the option of rail in our county. And um, I would also just say that um, as a, a possible suggestion for uh, Mr. Preston, um, I found him difficult to hear often and uh, perhaps um, an improved mic system for him might be beneficial. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Stowe. Our next speaker is Saladin Sale. Thank you, Chair Brown. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Freight capability on both lines between Felton and Watsonville is essential to the county's ability to respond to the effects of climate change. Year-round fire season is a reality in California. Henry Cal Redwoods and the Poganip lie between Felton and Santa Cruz in steep, heavily forested terrain, accessible only by trail and the Felton Branch rail line. The fire service has introduced a game-changing new tool, the fire train. A typical fire train is comprised of locomotive, fire suppression car, two water tenders, and a command center caboose. Fitted with firefighting spray nozzles, the train carries 56,000 gallons of water or fire suppression retardant. This technology seems tailor-made for the densely forested areas along the San Lorenzo River between Felton and Santa Cruz. The ability to send a fire train north through Watsonville to this inaccessible area would be lost by design if the RTC cuts off the Felton line from the state rail network. The fire chiefs of every San Lorenzo Valley Fire District are on record opposing any abandonment of either the Santa Cruz or Felton branch lines for this reason. Don't make the potentially catastrophic mistake of abandoning the tremendous potential of our fire train capable freight rail lines. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sale. Our next speaker is Buzz Anderson. <clears throat> Um, hi, thank you. Um, I want to thank Mr. Preston and RTC Council for the facts on rail banking, uh, which was, has been done in hundreds of communities. And I want to reiterate that there is really no viable freight on the Santa Cruz Watsonville line. Uh, the last three operators have failed. Uh, successful freight operators, they make their money by hauling mostly fossil fuels, uh, such as gas, uh, coal, and oil. Also aggregates, sand, rock, and cement, uh, which uh, they did for the cement factory and uh, concrete factory up in Davenport. Uh, fertilizers, uh, granular or liquid, uh, shipping containers, and uh, some large bulk goods. And that's really not gonna happen on the Santa Cruz Watsonville line. Uh, also, I wanna point out that the estimated cost of $60 million to repair the Santa Cruz Watsonville tracks more than likely, you know, that's going to increase uh, possibly close to $100 million. And I think the public should not have to spend that kind of money for the benefit of any private for profit enterprise. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Rebecca Downing. Thank you. I would just like to add for informational purposes for your discussion. At 
previous didn't make any money. Um, they tried. And part of the reason they tried was because the RTC owned the line, but it was sold to you by Union Pacific, who was operating at a loss. And that is when the cement plant was actually functioning. So please consider that um, as you proceed. The only other thing that might be helpful to know uh, on behalf of Roaring Camp is how much freight was shipped from Roaring Camp to Watsonville bet between the time they acquired the easement in 1985 and the time that the RTC purchased it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have uh, the Fort Zoom host. Not sure who that is, but you can go ahead and introduce yourself and you have a minute and a half. My apologies. I thought I was on my personal account. This is Faina Siegel. Um, I would like to uh, talk to you today about the uh, repair costs that are being quoted in the most recent RTC report. Um, these report estimates, we couldn't find any uh, background on them. So it would be very nice to hear where they got uh, this estimate from. And then just like to point out that the repair costs are not taking into account the five to one return we normally get from state and federal grants. In fact, the item eight on today's agenda demonstrates that only 20% of Measure D funds were needed as a match to repair the Pajaro uh, River Rail Bridge. That means that the money we get from Measure D um, should, should be uh, times five when you take into account state and federal grants that are much more likely to come if we keep our freight easements in place. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's see. Um, I The next hand up is Judy Gittleson, um, and I'm, I apologize, I'm tr tr on tracking it. it um, I, I think you've spoken on this issue, but if you have not, you'll remember better than I, and if, if so, go, go for it. It's, it's your turn. Thank you. I'm just going to address this one very briefly. I think on this call, we've heard from three freight carriers or more that freight is a real viable future option in the uh, Santa Cruz branch line and the whole way and uh, that we shouldn't eliminate that period. So um, I think keeping the option of rail and keeping the freight accessible as well is something that's been um, shown to me today. So I just wanted to chime in on that. Thank you. And um, I think the, the adverse abandonment is not a positive thing for our community. Thank you, Ms. Gittleson. Our next speaker is Sean. Funding and um, uh, uh, Roaring Camp Railroads and money invested, all of that is searchable and verifiable. Um, does, uh, if anybody thinks Roaring Camp isn't telling the truth, then what you're saying is that uh, the, the local fire chiefs are lying to you as well. Nobody on this board knows better, knows better than the collective knowledge of all of these fire chiefs put together. You know, local, uh, local Jeff Denholm brought a, a, a gel fire suppressant to market that extends the value of water by a factor of eight to 10 does the job faster and it, re and it reduces water hauling needs and expense. Uh, it's non-toxic, so better for well water in the mountains. Uh, it's, uh, uh, um, it's biodegradable. It's safer for firefighters to use. And firefighters deserve the, the, uh, the, uh, the right to access the tools that they decide uh, uh, are safe and efficient uh, for, for, for them to use. And uh, these old railroad lines, um, um, uh, some of their history is that they're the ones that supplied San Francisco with uh, uh, rail, with uh, redwood lumber to rebuild all of those uh, all of those buildings. That's part of the legacy here. Support your firefighters; they saved your very lives. Thank you, Sean. 
our next speaker and potentially final speaker, if I don't see additional hands come up, uh, is Bud Colligan. Uh, Chair Brown, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Just wanted to say that I really appreciate uh, Commissioner McPherson's comments and also Commissioner Alternate's uh, uh, Quinn's comments about data. Um, I, I just want to make three comments. Uh, first, um, if there is a viable opportunity for freight, I think it needs to be demonstrated. Uh, we've had three failed rail operators, and uh, if you count Union Pacific, that would be four. So where's the data? Uh, where are the specifics on uh, freight? They have all left because they couldn't make money. Secondly, Roaring Camp uh, said that their business would die. But I think the question that needs to be answered by them is what will they do for the next 25 years? They have existed for five years without um, uh, you know, uh, access to Watsonville. Uh, the Capitola Trestle and a couple other bridges are out of service. So how will they uh, survive during those 25 years? It's, it's important for them to figure out their business. And lastly, um, regarding uh, comments about uh, public comment and overwhelming support, I think that 13,315 uh, certified signatures for the Greenway Initiative are a testament to a strong feeling by the public otherwise. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Colligan. Our next speaker, uh, um, we do. I do see more hands coming up, uh, so we will carry on. Our next speaker is Charles Hicks. Hi, thank you. To mention, and that sort of has to, to do with the whole joie de vivre and you know enjoyment of your life. And one of the things that I would love to do personally would be able to take my bicycle, go to a train station, and take my take the train down to Watsonville and get off and ride around Watsonville with my bicycle. I'm not, it's it's difficult for me to consider taking my bike from here all the way to Watsonville, um, pedal it myself. And I'm also not particularly interested in getting on a bus and going down there, but a train would be fantastic. Um, so anyway, that's just another aspect of it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hicks. Our next speaker is Mary Offerman. Mary, you're up. I unmuted. Can you hear yeah. me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. We're talking a lot about choosing to abandon the, the rail rights because we can't pay to maintain, or we found it difficult to maintain our freight, our freight necessities or the necessity, the, the repairs to continue. I didn't write this in advance, sorry. Um, at any rate, I think that we can't necessarily foresee what the future brings in terms of necessity for freight because uh, climate change is changing uh, our, our focus to local, local resources and local networks more than before. Um, so I, I don't think that projecting future use of freight is necessarily based on past use of freight. But mainly I want to address the fact that I believe that the rail line is an essential artery between Santa Cruz, between actually between Davenport and Watsonville. And we mustn't cut the blood between among all of us. I want to see our county united and I'm very inspired very strong in favor of equity transport that serves every one of us, every color, every economic status. And so please do not abandon the rail lines. Thank you, Ms. Offerman. Our next speaker will be Cheyenne. And you wanna press star six to unmute yourself. Myself. There you go. Yay. So, hi, my name is Cheyenne Hauk, and I am a lifelong resident of San Lorenzo Valley. Having sat through this meeting and hearing all presentations and public comments, I keep circling back to the notion that Roaring Camp, quote, needs to come to the table. 
As far as I can see, they weren't adequately invited to the table, and the terms of their arrangement are being renegotiated without their involvement. With all this talk of them coming to the table, moving forward, Roaring Camp needs to be allotted more than two three-minute talking segments when discussing their future. That is all. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Cheyenne. Okay, so I, we have four speakers left with hands up, and I, I'm going to do a last call now for speakers. Um, if we get a lot more hands coming up, I will uh, reduce the time to one minute. Um, I'm hoping that we're getting towards the end here, and so I, I'm going to go through these last few speakers and call on you, um, but anyone who... Uh, wants to speak after uh, Salvador Allen, uh, you will get one minute and uh, we'll just keep moving through. So our next speaker I'm going to call in and I am calling on people who have not already spoken on this item. Uh, I, I do see hands up and I believe from people who have already spoken. So I'm uh, going to call on a next speaker who has not commented uh, and that would be Eric Hansen. Hello, Commissioners. Uh, this is Eric Hansen. Um, I wrote to you previously in regards to my concern over your capricious and arbitrary disregard for California state legislation uh, and policy. Uh, the California Freight Mobility Plan 2020 supports short line railroad improvements through infrastructure upgrades and advanced technologies, stating short line railroads are often overlooked as transport solutions this strategy would develop a short line rail improvement plan to encourage track upgrades, industrial rail access improvements, advanced technologies, clean alternate energy considerations to improve system efficiency, increase speeds, reduce emissions, and promote cost effective shifts of truck to rail. That is our state legislation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Richard Murphy. Hi. Um, I've found it interesting that all the discussion has been that freight can't make profits while running this route. And actually, I think the proper way to think of this is that freight is symbiotic with the passenger options. Uh, freight can help defray the cost of the line so that the passenger operation doesn't cost the community as much. The RTC bought this line with the purpose of increasing transit in the corridor, and I think they need to think about it holistically. So anyway, that's all. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Okay, um, next up, Salvador Allen. Hey, I hope everyone's doing well today. So I have a couple comments, a couple questions, nothing crazy. Um, back before the RTC bought the rail line, Union Pacific offered three different forms of excursion slash passenger service. The RTC said no to all three. The question is why? I just don't know any reasons why the RTC uh, abandoned those thoughts from Union Pacific. Second, no one's discussed uh, Iowa Pacific and other holdings companies and their business practices and how poor they were. Iowa Pacific holds the nickname IOU Pacific for going bankrupt, not because of Santa Cruz, but because of other poor investments. Doesn't prove that Santa Cruz freight isn't viable because they had to leave for their own poor investments. Uh, Santa Cruz history is super, super uh, deep in rail. Santa Cruz and its county, its rail built California multiple times. It's incredible. Um, now, I just want to leave you guys with a little, you know, quote, famous quote, a little saying, uh, you don't know what you've got uh, until it's gone. And I just want you to think about that. And I yield my time. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Okay. I, so I, um, I'm going to call on Adrian Brandt and I, I did say what I was going to reduce to one minute, but since you are the ostensibly the last speaker, um, let's just go ahead and I'll give you one and a half minutes. doesn't seem fair. <laughs> oh, here we go. Um, okay. So um, Mr. Brandt, I'll give you one and a half minutes and, um, and we'll regroup. Um, but I am going to, I'm going to cut off public comment uh, 
pretty soon here. So uh, on to you, Mr. Brandt or Ms. Brandt, Adrian. Okay, I just got the unmute. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so uh, I just uh, food for thought. You know, I, I've heard today uh, 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 several comments disparaging the concept of uh, transportation infrastructure benefiting private businesses. Um, very disdainfully spoken. Um, that's what transportation infrastructure is. Uh, Highway one, bridges, whatever, counties, cities, all over this country build transportation infrastructure. It's not a profit-making business, and it's there for taxpaying businesses and commerce and for taxpayers in the form of rail riders or people who are enjoying the fact that certain uh, traffic is no longer on their roads and on the rails. So just keep in mind that that, that to me is a fallacy. Uh, it's not a point against uh, making uh, prudent, uh, long-lasting uh, investments in public infrastructure. Uh, this this is a corridor um, that, that counties all over the country and cities all over the country would kill to have. Um, it, sure, it needs work, but it's something that is absolutely a jewel. You think about the cost of the real estate to acquire or create something like that from scratch, and it's essentially cost prohibitive and impossible. Imagine if it wasn't there. So it, it's definitely a matter of preserving what you have and do not be afraid or deterred by specious arguments about investing in infrastructure for private business. Thank you. Uh, okay, I am, uh, so we're gonna go to one minute regardless of what happens at this point. Because that, that, Madam, Madam, up. Madam yes. Chair, procedural comment. Commissioner Rockin. Both yes. the spirit and the law of the Brown Act do not require endless meetings. The people who are listening to us have gone down. We've lost 25% of our viewers. and. I think the public's right to sort of not spend, we've already been four and a half hours here, to, to be able to watch our actual discussion and you know comments from the commissioners is equally important as the last three or four comments. The people who joined this call four hours after it began, apparently, because you've asked for them to join several times. So please feel free. I'm not I'm telling you what to do. I'm making a suggestion to end this after the last, we're now looking at one, two speakers. Don't allow anyone else to speak. You have that right, both under yes. the, law, the spirit and the letter of the Brown Act. Thank you, Commissioner Rodkin. Uh, that was what I was just about to say, um, because I do see that hands continue to go up, and you know, we, at, at a certain point, we do need to to move on. Um, but I, so I will. So our last speaker will be Todd Marco. Um, I want to ask Stacy. Um, if if you, you I believe a uh, Stacy has spoken on this item, uh, so uh, but this could be a different Stacy. If if you are a different Stacy who has not spoken, I will call on you. You will have one minute. Um, but if you have already spoken, then we need to move on. So not hearing uh, anyone. I I'm sorry, the same yeah. Stacy. Same, Stacy. But you've used less than half of this public comment period for public comments. Understood. Um, we have so a lot Greenway, of people. Um, want the to Greenway petition has been advertised misleadingly, um, saying that it would make the uh, trail happen quicker, which is untrue. Stacey. And the number of signatures Stacey, is. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry, Stacy, but I, I do need to cut you off here. Um, I, I recognize your um, your strong interest in this issue, and I, you know, I, I am not trying to curtail public comment, but we are um, speaking to a particular item. And again, uh, the broader campaign in the community with the voters will take place elsewhere. Um, I'm sorry, that's frustrating. Um, we do want to just keep moving. Uh, so with that, I'm going to give uh, Mr. Marco, you have one minute and that you will be our last speaker on this item. And then we will move on to item 23. Thank you. Thank you. I'll keep this short. Uh, hi, this is Todd Marco, executive director of Nicene Rio Gateway in Aptos. I just wanted to emphasize again that this discussion, uh, excuse me, this vicious debate is about freight on our rail corridors. It is not helpful to entangle this difficult discussion with misinformation regarding rail transit or to bring into question whether or not rail banking would preclude development of rail transit. 
Misinformation does not help the public, and the absence of truth is always demonstrated over time. Please, fellow members of the public, please understand that you are being misled. All right, um, so we will now bring it back to the commission for discussion. Uh, Commissioner McPherson? Yeah, I mean, this is not an action item as has been stated before, but I, I'd like to just make a general uh, request uh, for direction for uh, our RTC staff to reach out to Roaring Camp again and uh, to uh, get updated communications with them. I think it's, I think everybody can see that this is dearly, dearly needed. And I think that um, I'd just like to uh, ask our staff to uh, pursue further uh, communications and negotiations with Roaring Camp. Very general. Thank you, Commissioner McPherson. I, I I would agree with that, and I, you know I think we have been having that conversation, uh, and I appreciate you reiterating that here, um, and and hopefully that that will happen as we move forward. Uh, Commissioner Schifrin, you are up next. Thank you. Um, I want to start by agreeing with Commissioner McPherson. I think uh, that's where I was going to end up. Although that wasn't where I was going to start, because I think this is an opportunity to try to, especially since we, while we have many members of the public who have been here before, we have also other members of the public who are here for the first time. And it may be helpful to take a little time to put this into context. Um, the staff report, I think, was very uh, detailed and provided a lot of information. But if you're new to the game, it could be very confusing. It was somewhat you know, difficult to understand even for me who's been in the game for a long time. So I wanted to talk about why is rail abandonment even an issue? Why are we talking about it? And really at root, it's about what do we want to do with the rail line, with the rail corridor? And in the end, the choices are simple, although the details are extremely complex. If I could give a little background there are two types of transportation on railroad tracks. There's freight service, there's passenger service. Freight service is regulated by the federal government. Passenger service isn't. Historically, the Santa Cruz rail line has been used for both freight and passenger. A freight easement uh, on the line gives a rail operator the right to run freight trains on the line. When the RTC bought the rail line, it bought the property but Union Pacific sold the freight easement to a private company. The RTC has an agreement with the current owner of the freight easement where each party has rights and obligations. A freight easement can be abandoned in two ways, but it must be approved by the Federal Surface Transportation Board, the STB. The owner of the freight easement can voluntarily apply for abandonment or a public agency or others like the RTC can apply for an adverse abandonment. The company that holds the freight easement now has refused to apply for abandonment voluntarily, ostensibly, I think, because it's uh, based on the opposition of Roaring Camp. The SDB will only approve abandonment, again, as I understand it, based on evidence that the freight service is no longer viable and won't be in the future. I think that's the, the context in which we're all sort of dealing with this issue. What are a few, what I think of as indisputable facts? The rail line from Watsonville North is currently inoperable for either freight or passenger service. It needs significant repairs before trains can uh, run on it again. And we've heard a, got a lot of testimony about how much those repairs may or may not cost, but they need to be repaired. It's inoperable now. Secondly, the there is a proposal from Greenway to, to uh, for a 20 foot wide uh, trail in the existing right of way. The, the Greenway is defined as including two lanes of wheel traffic on a paved path, a divider and a separate walkway for pedestrians with a shoulder on both sides. This trail, as I understand it, would be about 20 feet wide. As the, direct, the executive director said earlier, the Greenway Trail proposal would require the removal of the tracks for it to be constructed because the corridor's right of way is not wide enough for both the Greenway Trail and the railroad tracks. 
The railroad tracks, however, cannot be removed as long as there is a free easement. The only way to remove the free easement is to abandon it, either voluntarily by the owner or through adverse abandonment. The Surface Transportation uh, Board, as I said, must approve any application to abandon it. So in the end, the Greenway Trail requires the removal of the railroad tracks, and this cannot occur without the abandonment of the freight easement. So this, that's the, you know, this is where we get into what, what are the motives of the various participants in this discussion that we've been hearing from. It's confusing because not everyone has the same motives for wanting abandonment. The RTC staff favors ab abandonment, as I understand it, because it will make it easier to build the, the rail trail along the corridor. Greenway supporters favor abandonment, obviously, because the Greenway Trail can't be built without it. Roaring Camp opposes abandonment because it fears that it will eliminate their opportunity to provide rail serv a freight service and maybe even passenger service in the future um, on the line. So the arguments are that the benefits of abandonment from the RTC staff perspective are that they would make constructing segments of the rail trail easier by dealing with liability issues and by reducing environmental impacts and the cost. The supporters of rail service oppose abandonment because they see it as the first step to removing the tracks. Greenway, Greenway advocates, as seen in the definition of the trail itself, recognize and support the removal of the tracks so that a trail can be constructed. However, unfortunately, from my perspective, Greenway advocates make a number of misleading arguments that only confuse the issue. They argue for one, that the RTC only wants to remove the freight easement because the cost of repairing the tracks for freight is expensive and it's not about the kind of passenger service Roaring Camp provides. This is true, but ignores the fact that by removing the tracks, no, no train service will be possible. Greenway advocates also argue that abandonment does not require removal of the tracks. This is probably, the, from my perspective, the most disingenuous argument since while it is legally true, it doesn't admit the fact that without abandonment, there can be no Greenway. Greenway advocates argue that even if the tracks are removed, they can be put back if funding for rail service becomes feasible. How likely is that? Uh, especially should the Greenway initiative pass. Greenway advocates argue that rail banking requires that the rail corridor be preserved. This only means that the right of way can't be sold off. With rail banking, the tracks can be ripped up. The Greenway initiative has now qualified for the ballot and will be voted on in June. It's related to the abandonment issue because the supporters of the initiative have made and will continue to make the argument that the initiative would not prevent rail service from returning to the corridor even if the Greenway Trail is built. Is it realistic to think that public transit would ever return to the return if the initiative passes since it adopts the trail as county policy and all but eliminates references to rail in the county general plan? Despite the misleading rhetoric, if the freight easement is abandoned, Greenway supporters will undoubtedly advocate that the rail tracks be removed, and if they succeed, the likelihood of rail service ever returning between Santa Cruz and Watsonville is zero to none. Based on all this, I do not support the adverse abandonment of freight easement, and if we could vote on it today, I would be voting no. Finally, in a fundamental way, this whole debate, as some speakers have said, at the commission seems like an exercise in futility. Among the over 6,000 6, emails I've received opposing abandonment was a letter from the San Lorenzo Fire District, opposing abandonment based on the potential need of an operated, operable rail line during an actual emergency, like a devastating wildfire. There has also been email and testimony from uh, private companies indicating that they would use the line to move their products if the line was in opera uh, operation. Given these and the strong opposition from Roaring Camp, I think it is extremely doubtful that the SDP would, would approve an adverse abandonment application. The most important 
point to remember from my perspective is that the greenway that will require the removal of the tracks and can only occur if the existing freight easement is abandoned. If there is to be a solution, it will be based on compromise and cooperation. I urge us to move forward. I urge us to move forward in that direction. And I hope staff, as indicated by Commissioner uh, McPherson, will take up the Roaring Camp offer to negotiate and see if it's possible to work out a mutually acceptable agreement. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Schifrin. I see uh, uh, Com Commissioner Rotkin, your hand up, and then uh, Commissioner Hernandez, I, I've got you next. So fortunately, I have a very brief comment because I want to basically associate myself with what Andy just said. Um, and I am not going to repeat his points. Um, <clears throat> the only thing I would offer is that I see in the negotiations, and in, to be clear, there may be different views about how how those negotiations have gone and to what extent uh, either uh, Roaring Camp or the RTC staff have been you know, forthcoming with willingness to be flexible and so forth. I'm, I won't get into that. I see that these negotiations offer the possibility because it's not wouldn't be adverse abandonment, <clears throat> but the possibility that we have some kind of an agreement that would be an alternative, a middle ground alternative. I don't know we'd ever get more than you know three votes for or one maybe, um, but that we might be might be possible to arrange in some of the segments, not all of them, in some of the twenty segments on this uh, corridor, to arrange ways to realign the track. Some of the track, if you do passenger service, needs to be realigned anyway. It's the curves are too sharp for pass pass passenger service, and so forth. So I'm interested in the possibility of additional flexibility that would um, allow us the possibility of perhaps modifying where they're not tearing out the track, tearing it out for all time, but modifying where the track goes, switching where the track is compared to where the trail might go. It won't work with a double wide greenway trail, as Andy pointed out, but it might well work with a trail that the RTC has been working on. Um, so that's the only thing I want to add to what Andy had to say. I also would be you know, unless there's some negotiated alternative that allows everyone to protect their interests, including Warring Camp, I also would be voting no on the proposal for uh, adverse abandonment. In fact, I would be voting no on adverse abandonment. I might be voting in favor of a rail banking arrangement in which there were certain protections for bringing back a complete uh, uh, passenger rail service. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner <coughs> uh, Commissioner Hernandez. <coughs> You're up. You know, I want to. I want to. First, I want to. I agree with both uh, Commissioner uh, Schifrin and uh, Rockin's uh, comments, and I want to thank uh, Commissioner Schifrin for uh, clarifying a lot of those points. Um, you know, this is a difficult situation. We received. I received. I counted them uh, over five thousand two hundred emails, and I did a search, and uh, we had over about two hundred emails from South County. So, you know, it's uh, I have a difficult time putting one of our premier tourist destination sites in our county in jeopardy of closure. Uh, you know, it's really concerning to me. Um, you know, but what's more concerning is abandoning the rail line. Um, you know, I'm fundamentally opposed to rail banking, um, which will most likely, you know, lead to the loss of the rail line. Uh, like one of the public commenters, commenters mentioned, uh, quoted Mark Stone, if you lift, lift the tracks, you lose the rail line. And that ultimately leads to more greenhouse gases, single occup occupant vehicle miles traveled, and continues to promote inequities in our county. You know, if we lose, if we lose the rail and we lose freight and the possibility of a, a passenger train, you know, Watsonville's 56,000 residents that are 85% Latino stand to lose everything from jobs, transportation equity, to quality of life. You know, we need to preserve the rail lines. We need to protect our county's gyms like Roaring Camp, as well as our economic interests, our assets in South County, our job providers in South County, like Agron, like Big Creek. So that's all I have to say.
Okay, thank you, Commissioner Hernandez. I will now call on Commissioner Bertrand. And you are on mute. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've been accepting every single call that's come to my cell phone. Um, shout out to Luna and her brother and her father who made that call possible. Um, you know, kids and family tradition was uh, very meaningful to me. Um, took my daughter on the running camp and we've attended weddings of her friend, uh, one wedding of her friend that, you know, rode that as a kid too. So it's it's been mentioned to me through many of these calls that people come from all over the state actually, uh, because they've had those ties to this railroad and um, they make it a big family event. And um, in many cases, I told people you could get a share of the railroad and even pass it on to um, your family members to keep that tradition going. So I, I, I deeply hear that and the calls had a lot of effect on me. Um, the other thing that had a lot of effect on me is uh, what the family that runs the railroad feels. And um, so I actually talked to Melanie Clark's sister and I got a deeper understanding of how the family feels. I haven't talked to Melanie Clark. I didn't think that was proper, um, but I had that conversation. So I hold that dearly. And um, I think we're trying to, as a commission, provide service to the county residents. And it was mentioned earlier that we have a fiduciary responsibility to spend our money accordingly. And I think the commission holds that also very dearly, that, that particular um, responsibility. It, it's a hard one. It's a hard one because the issue is so complicated and there are conflicting interests. So I'll end with this. Um, to many of the callers, I said, it's incumbent for Guy and Milani, I actually put it this way, to sit down and have a cup of coffee together. As a lot of you know, when I talk, when I organize meetings with individual members of the commission or people who are interested in the issues, I always ask, let's meet somewhere, Lulu's, Pete's, wherever, for a cup of coffee so we could sit down and see each other face to face. And, you know, how our interests are presented by Guy, I have full confidence in that, and I think Melanie Clark will do the same. But I think it's incumbent that they actually get together and have that conference. No lawyers, just to see who they are, feel each other out, and understand where they're coming from. It is critical that we preserve that option for Roaring Camp to use our segment to get down to the wharf. That is a real critical issue that we need to recognize um, that they're focused on. And so we need to hold that in our conversations with them. And maybe Rail Bank is the way to do it, I don't know. But I think we need to have agreements to actually focus on what their main concern is. And so that's my last point, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Bertrand. Uh, Commissioner Quinn, your turn. Oh, thank you, Chair Brown, for navigating through that. That was extremely uh, enlightening to hear from the public. You know, when, when Zach asked me to be the alternate commissioner, I, I, I really take this responsibility seriously. And we have some very difficult decisions to make. It's clear emotions are running high. And, and I'd like to recommend the, to Director Preston and others that as we wade into this decision, we ground ourselves in the facts again. Will the trail, do the studies indicate that the train will in fact get our county moving again? Can we afford it? What are the options? I, I think we have to be realistic. We've heard a lot of aspirational ideas about freight and the train, 
does the data support that this is really going to disimpact our county and get us moving? And maybe, you know, the, the uh, staff gave an excellent overview on the rail banking. I wonder if a synopsis of the studies to date would help inform the public on the data points we have to help guide this decision. Thank you, Commissioner Quinn. Uh, I see Commissioner Johnson, your hand, uh, Randy Johnson. Yeah, You're thank up. you, Chair. You know, um, maybe it was 10 or 12 years ago, uh, I met with the president of Semex. He was deeply concerned about not being able to move his product through uh, on the rail line all the way to, to Watsonville. And at that time, he he gave me information with respect to how many truckloads. Uh, if, if you stop tr uh, train service, it would translate into how many truckloads. It was a fantastic number. It was hundreds, I believe. Um, per week or per day, I kind of forget. That went away, and I think um, I think the viability of, of freight service kind of went away too, because that's when Union Pacific pretty much said, "Okay, we'll sell we'll sell you the line um, for eleven, whatever million plus ten million that that, that the um, RTC had." So um, I was a big, big believer in freight until that kind of went away. And then we, then I just looked at the the data, and just started counting noses with respect to how many people would actually use freight service on uh, on the rail, how many companies, and it was diminishing, diminishing, diminishing. And I kind of opposed the short short line uh, providers based on that information. Um, People are always sanguine about the fact that you know uh, freight service is going to work. Freight service is going to work. Well, it's been demonstrated uh, uh, specifically through earlier Union Pacific, uh, Iowa Pacific, Progressive, uh, the very same people today that are saying this, you know, that it'll work, it's viable, we'll, we'll just give it a chance, um, are ignoring history, okay? It's not really going to work. I think distilling kind of the uh, main issue with uh, Roaring Camp, who I respect, and believe me, from from you know uh, the interest of Scotts Valley, you know one of the big reasons, one of the big ways that our we support our our city is through hotel tax, and they are responsible for a lot of the hotel uh, hotel uh, um, traffic that we get. People know that that company, they come here, they stay here in Scotts Valley. It helps us. Nobody's interested in seeing them go away. Believe me. Um, but one of the, you know, one of the interesting things is that um, I think probably if you distill it down, they're interested in preserving their future. And I think the risk that they see is that the ability to obtain the equipment that um, gives, gives them a sustainable future. Now, we keep talking about, and again, uh, I'm... Um, whistling in the dark here, so to speak, because I don't know about um, Highway 1. I, I don't know about, uh, you know, going underneath uh, uh, certain places in, in, on Highway 1. I do know that there is a 101 and 17 where people travel all the time. I don't know if there are bridges and so forth that are a problem there. But I think if we can solve that problem and give them a, an ability to kind of um, make sure that that section of their business is uh, guaranteed or at least has a future, I think a lot of their issues may go away. And so I would try and pay particular attention moving forward for our staff and also for them is let's do a, a pretty good analysis in what it takes to move, um, you know, large locomotives through, through uh, with uh, uh, trucks and see if it's viable. I, it's been done. We know this, okay? I, I think I have videos showing that. So if you distill that down, maybe some of the objections go away and it helps both parties. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Montesino, you're up. Yeah, thank you. Well, first of all, I just want to acknowledge all the, um, the other county folks that emailed me or called me um in regards to this uh, abandonment issue and supportive of um 
a supporter of our local business. Um, you know, uh, one of those who, uh, you know, I think everyone's has gotten to that, uh, um, uh, done that trip uh, over over a time. Um, but, you know, I associate myself with, um, you know, um, uh, Commissioner Schiffrin's remarks uh, made it really clear, uh, you know, what the issues uh, are upon us, and and do support, you know, sending it back to staff to see if we if we can um, get a, a compromise or, or a get together that, that would be an agreement with both of us for um, our local min six, and we still have uh, you know some freight service in, in our in our in, you know. In South County, I mean, you heard from Granite Rock. You, um, you didn't hear for Del Mar Foods, but they, you know, usually use them. And now the biodiesel Acron. Um, so they, you know, we do we do have some business in uh, in freight. So thank you. Thank you. Are there other commissioners who would like to address? The audience uh, and the commission before we move on. So, uh, uh, Mr. Hurst, I see you have your hand up, and I, um, I'm, I think you are representing Watsonville, and um, not as a commissioner today. I'll uh, give you an opportunity to uh, share your thoughts, and um, and then I have a, a couple of things I'd like to say before we uh, conclude this item. Go for it. Thank you very much, Chair. Yes, I am uh, an alternate uh, for the city of Watsonville, and um, well, I and I'll keep it brief. Uh, you know, it hadn't been my uh, service in uh, in Watsonville all these years that that um, causes me to to speak today. But it is my um, experience in in traveling the world and having ridden bikes uh, in Kathmandu and Cusco and walked on some very narrow trails all over the, the world that I know that many things are possible here. Certainly, if you look at history, and history sometimes repeats itself, that millions of millions of dollars of freight have moved on this line historically, and who knows what could happen if the line was repaired, perhaps millions of dollars of freight would move again. And so, for me, abandonment is a no-go. And certainly rail banking is, uh, when the rails are gone, they're not coming back. So let's get moving. Let's put some money into repair of the line. Let's put some things on it that are light and electric and move people. Let's get moving. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, okay, Commissioner Schifrin, I'll... A very quick question, based on what uh, Commissioner McPherson said and others, what are the next steps here? I want to ask the executive director what he sees as the next steps after this non-vote today. Um, I see um, that the commission really wants to try to work this out. I think the commission... Um, listen carefully and understands the concerns of both Roaring Camp and the RTC. And, and I believe um, without without a vote directing me to, there's a desire and um, a willingness to open uh, up discussions again with, with Roaring Camp, to, to understand their concerns, to see if they can be addressed. Um, and um, and I'm willing to do that. Um, so that's the direction I'm going to go. I'm, we'll continue to provide information to the commission in various different ways. Um, and, and I would see that as our next step. Thank you. Okay. I um, thank you, uh, Commissioner Schifrin. I, that was my question that I was going to ask. And before I, uh, uh, close this item, I do want to just say a couple of words myself. Um, I want to appreciate uh, members of the public who came out and all of the many people who did communicate with us. Many of those messages were um, standard messages, auto messages, and many were very heartfelt uh, uh, messages about uh, both Roaring Camp and the future of the rail line. And so I just, I wanted to appreciate that uh, there are many, many people who have an interest in this issue and it is a very confusing one. Uh, um, 
And I appreciate Commissioner Schifrin for laying that out in a way that I think um, you know really resonated for me. And so I, I uh, third or fourth or fifth, <laughs> I'm not sure where we're at right now, th those comments, again, without repeating them. Um, I want to provide uh, some full disclosure. This is a, kind of a follow-up to the earlier request that was made about disclosing the votes on uh, bringing this, whether or not to bring this item and how we would bring this item to the public agenda. Uh, many people reached out, were concerned about this uh, being a discussion on potential adverse abandonment happening in closed session, and we wanted it to be out in the open. I agree wholeheartedly with that. Um, I was in full disclosure, I was one of the no votes uh, at that time at our last meeting in closed session. And I was a no vote because I precisely, <laughs> because I was so concerned about the potential for this item to really rile up um, emotions and concerns in our community that um, we were not prepared to uh, adequately address as a commission. We are, um, as those of you who are observers know, um, we are in a bit of a stalemate about what to do with the, uh, the rail line at the moment uh, as kind of evidence through some 6-6 uh, six, six votes. And because I felt like we didn't have enough information and we really weren't there, I was concerned about how the community would respond. And not so much not wanting to hear from the community, but concerned that the community, that this was gonna cause people to get really upset, and it has. And um, give, and I also want to agree with Commissioner uh, McPherson and others who have said, uh, we really do need uh, more information. I wanna reiterate that and confirm that um, apparent consensus. I haven't heard any objections to uh, and directing our staff to go back to the uh, the negotiating room and to have uh, ongoing conversation with uh, Roaring Camp. I absolutely support that. And until we can uh, get some more clarity about that, and um, and also uh, from the from the public, um, I think we do have uh, uh, an election coming in June, and uh, we'll be talking about that on our our next item. So I'll leave that. Um, but until that time, I think it's really um, not a productive conversation for us to just kind of recycle. Uh, so I, I, that was my, um, my rationale. It was not about uh, a lack of transparency or disclosure. I am all about uh, transparency and public decision-making. Uh, so I, I just wanted to be clear about that when you see those of you who are watching, see the minutes. Um, it w again, um, I, I just, I'll just say without any additional uh, commentary that um, at this time, I, I don't support, uh, I wouldn't support adverse abandonment of the rail line if we were to be, take a vote uh, today. I think there's a lot more work to be done. And um, I look forward to being a part of that conversation uh, in the spirit of transparency and, and also um, efficacy, trying to move us forward. Uh, so I'll leave it there. And uh, seeing no other hands up, uh, we'll we'll close this item and move on to our our next item on our agenda. I believe this is our last item. Yes, it is. And um, <laughs> another item, <laughs> probably <laughs> significant interest. Uh, I want. I, I just want to really quickly, Commissioner Rockin, before I turn it over to you. Um, oh, it goes to the staff first, actually, and then. Yeah. Okay, that's right. Thank you. Intro. I just heard your voice, so I thought you wanted to. Jump no, in. no. Um, okay, so um, at item 23, we will move on to item 23. Uh, this is a proposal for a potential uh, alternative ballot measure regarding the rail and trail. Uh, Luis Mendez, our deputy director, will give a staff report, and then I'm going to turn it over to Commissioner Rotkin uh, to make a few comments about the proposal, uh, which did come from myself, uh, uh, Commissioner Rotkin, and Commissioner Montesino. And um, I and then I will um, go through the we'll go through the commissioner questions if there are questions and then we will open it up to the public depending on how what happens here in this early, this first uh, step uh, and when, at that time uh, I will be giving one minute once again we are kind of have, we're having a very long meeting and uh, we want to just get through this so um, with that I'll turn it over to. Uh, Deputy Director Mendez for a staff report and possibly 
uh, our RTC Council, Steve Mattis. Good afternoon, Commission, Commissioners. I'll do my best to be, to be very brief in the interest of time. Um, uh, staff just uh, simply recommends that you consider this uh, commissioner request for a potential advisory ballot measure uh, for the uh, June uh, primary election. A uh, couple of things to, to note if, is that the commission does want to proceed with a potential advisory ballot measure. Uh, the deadline to submit um, what is needed to the county board of supervisors to place the measure on the ballot is March March 11th. So that would be very quick. And so you would need to, you would need to you know make sure you um, agree on language for a ballot measure uh, and the uh, question that uh, would be placed on the ballot uh, and would need would want to have that uh, um, you know the, the review necessary from legal counsel um, uh, in order to do that you know, by March 11th. So you will have very very much time. Uh, and then also um, you could get an, a cost estimate from uh, elections department and what it, what might might cost to the commission if and that such an advisory measure was placed on the ballot. Uh, and uh, it was an estimate of uh, half a million to a million dollars. Uh, and that depends on a number of things. Um, and it's uh, and one of those is the number of registered voters in, in the county, how many of the ballot measures are sharing the cost. Uh, uh, so that's why it's kind of a, a wide uh, ranging uh, estimate. Uh, with that, you know, as, uh, so staff recommends you consider this uh, this request. And, and thank you. Okay, Mr. Mattis, do you have anything to add? I, I do not. Um, I provided the count of the commission with uh, advice on this issue already. Yes, thank you. Uh, so you all should have received a written memo uh, about this item, and um, if if you do have questions, uh, we'll get we can provide time for, to for those. Um, I guess with that, we will uh, turn it, oh, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Rockin, uh, who was going to make some introductory comments about the item since it did come from commissioners. Thank you very much, <coughs> uh, Chair Brown. First of all, I, I will be brief. I, I'm not going to repeat all the things. We have, I think, a very clear um, introductory uh, report from the three of us about you know, what our intentions are in doing this. Um, I will briefly summarize them, but not make every point. And I'm also going to try and do this in a way, I mean, I'm sure people may object to the characterizations I make, but I'll do my best to not be uh, bombastic in the way I do this. So people feel compelled to enter in some, you know, huge debate about it. Uh, but I think people need to be clear about why this is being proposed. And I think it's fair. And there's also a uh, attachment which shows the actual language that uh, the three of us are proposing for what the ballot measure might say. The first thing to say is, I really, we are at loggerheads in a 6-6 vote at this point, and it, it's difficult even if we had seven votes or a clearer, even stronger majority uh, in favor of, let's say, for example, uh, make proceeding with uh, passenger rail and doing everything we can to get there. We've already heard on the earlier item today, uh, the one before this one, that there are other barriers uh, to doing that than simply having the a, 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 commission that knows what it wants, which is not so clear uh, in terms of our collective actions. Uh, but the my own view is that one way to possibly break out of this 6-6 this, uh, six, six tie or this loggerhead is to get a clear indication from members of the public on what they really want. And I unfortunately do not feel that the Greenway measure does that in a clear way. I think that the uh, again, I'm, I don't mean to attack the motives of the Greenway people. I'm just saying in terms of what's put in front of us there. Um, it, the, the measure, on the one hand, defines a green what a Greenway is in a way that re, is a double wide trail, I mean, to put it in simple terms, um, that really prohibits the possibility of future rail. Unless you tear out the track you put, the, uh, the, the uh, trail you've put in, you, you won't have rail in the future. There are other arguments the public have made about once you remove the rail, the difficulty of bringing it back. That, that's not necessarily on Greenway, but I think that's a political reality. Not, not a legal question of whether you have a legal right, but whether you have the practical and political possibility of ever bringing rail back once any, any, se any segment of it is taken out. And something's built there, a recreational facility is built there, built there in its place. So the, the Greenway measure, in effect, says, yes, we want to trail. We want it to be our priority. That makes it very clear. Uh, it goes so far as to say, let's take every reference 
to, in fact, the only action, the actual action as opposed to advisory issues in the measure is that the county take every reference to rail planning for rail out of its general plan, which suggests that, you know, how would you ever get back to having rail come back if you do no planning for it for the next 20 years or however long you think that process is going to be before there's money available? Some kind of a deus ex machina, the, the rail is going to drop out of the sky, but you've done no planning for it. So again, if there were clear votes in favor of rail and a strong way from the public, and we knew that that's really our first priority, we could continue to work on with difficulty on a variety of trail segments. And they are more difficult, I think, than mem members of the public fully understand several of these. Um, we work on those, but in the meantime, we only get $2 million a year out of Measure D uh, for, for rail. And some of that has to be used on fixing bridges and making that stuff happen, that's really important. Some of it needs to be used on matching money if we're gonna go for grants. Um, uh, it, and so you wouldn't be able to build it out of any one year's measure D allotment, but you might build it out of six or five and be at some point where if you were saving that money up and it really was your priority and you had the votes to do it, you would move ahead and eventually you would actually get the EIR done that was talked about earlier. And then you would be able to go and apply for money to make this thing happen. On the, conversely, if the people really want trail to be their first priority and they care less about rail on some level, I can only speak for myself. I, I'm, I am guided by the public on these kinds of questions. I don't know that I'd be guided on a 51% majority one way or the other, but if you had a decisive vote of the public saying, this is what we want, I, I'm someone who would open my mind to other alternatives, quite honestly. But I don't think the Greenway measure will be persuasive to me on that, whether it passes or fails one way or the other. Um, just because it's, again, the, the campaign is already being run on the basis of, well, you can have a trail now and then you could have rail in the future. I don't think the way it's being planned, you would ever have rail in the future if that uh, measure were fought, passed and then followed through with uh, by the commission. So I wanted to offer, and I, my colleagues, I think, joined me in this, uh, Sandy Brown and Eduardo Montesino, that we want to put something on the ballot that would give a clear litmus test, a clear indication of what the public really wants that would allow us to feel that it really was expressing public opinion and then we could make a hard choice about this. I don't feel that the Greenway measure provides that. Uh, you know, again, if it were to pass overwhelmingly uh, in its form, it might still be a question of people, did people vote for it because they thought they could have real someday? And which seems to me under Andy's comments, virtually impossible. So that's, the, that's what's being proposed here. Um, I don't think we're gonna have a huge debate about this. It's an expensive measure to put on the ballot. We don't have a lot of time unless I get some indication that there are commissioners beyond the three of us who think this is a really great idea to put this on the ballot, I'll be clear, I may not may even make the motion to do so. Um, I, I don't know what the point of having another 6-6 six, six vote would be if that's where we're gonna come out on this thing. So I'm not trying, I'm interested in time, it's late in the day, I'm not trying to drag this out forever, but I want people to be clear about why I put this on the agenda and why I was joined, I believe my colleagues joined me in putting this on the, on the, on the agenda and just get some reading of sort of how commissioners feel about whether, and again, should we not be proposed prepared at this moment to put this on the ballot? Perhaps if there's an ambiguous result one way or the other out of the June vote on the Greenway measure, this could be a measure that's brought back and make a lot of sense in November or some other time in the future. I don't wanna rule that out, uh, but, but at this point, I, I wanna get a reading on whether it's worth any more time this afternoon um, and certainly our time, our staff's time, and everybody's in a real rush to get this on a ballot by June, I think it was 13th, we were told, or June 11th, I forget the date. 13th, was it, Luis? 7th. 7th, yeah, I mean, that's coming right up. So that that's what's going on. Uh, let me ask Eduardo or uh, Sandy Brown if they want to add anything to my comments. Eduardo has his hand up, so I'm betting he's championing to, to say something here. Yes, uh, Commissioner Montesino. <laughs> Uh, uh, thank you for that. You know, I, I joined this effort with Mike because I thought, you know, um, it's a great idea, you know, um, uh, uh, because I have the same sentiments that it's not a very, uh, uh, what's going to come to the electorate is not, you know, it's not a very um, yes or no vote. So um, my interest was, you know, both sides, you know, whether you agree with one side or the other, both sides claim they have the public on their side. And, you know, this would be an opportunity for uh, the public to really weigh in um, and, and say, I, I want rail or I just want a trail. 
um, that was where, you know where I was coming from, and and like I said, um, I, I agree with a lot of the comments with, uh, that Commissioner Rockin said. Um, uh, you know, we we, we got to get you know it's the, uh, the community together. It's it's ripping the community apart. Whether uh, more in Santa Cruz than in Watsonville, but um, I can see there. Uh, um, you, you know, it's it's tearing the community apart. Where and here at the commission, we're at six six, and it seems to be no no moving forward on on either front. So, like I said, uh, we just wanted to put that up. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I I do see other commissioners have hands up, and I want to uh, make time for questions uh, right now. And we do have. Uh, people who want to speak on this issue for which you'll have one minute. So if we could kind of try to keep it to questions here and then we'll come back for uh, comments and any further discussion on the part of the commission uh, after the public comment. Uh, Commissioner Schifrin. I have a procedural request, not so much a, a question at this point. Um, while I agree and uh, that the proposed initiative is confusing and contradictory uh, along the lines that Commissioner Rodkin has indicated. And I think that the proposed advisory measure would be desirable, does ask a much clearer question. Um, I am concerned with the um, legal issues that have been brought to our attention given the timing and given the um, some issues around clarity about what the commission can do and can't do. Um, and given all of that, I, I think it would be better to um, withdraw the proposal and just not move forward with it at this time. I think we need more information on the legal situation and um, it is rushed. And while I, th while I think, and I'm very supportive of the measure itself, uh, and I think it is a good idea, I don't think that we should uh, move forward with it at this time for, as I say, legal issues and timing issues. So I don't know, uh, maybe we could ask uh, Steve, uh, our attorney, what if uh, uh, the commissioners who pr have brought this forward would be willing to withdraw it from the agenda, what would be the result of that? And I guess I'm asking you uh, whether you'd be willing to consider that. Asking me whether I'd be willing to consider that, you're saying? Yes, and also yeah. since it comes from the three of you, but yeah. I think first maybe asking our attorney about what the procedure would be, <clears throat> what would happen if the um, proponents was asked to withdraw the recommendation. Um, this, we still have to go through the, the whole process? Uh, no, you do not. If, if, if the, if the, if the proponent, this is a commissioner, a sponsored item. And so if the commissioners who brought this to the attention or, uh, put it on the agenda, withdraw it from the agenda, then the commission can end its discussion on the issue. Now, um, if you want to consider whether or not to put it on or have a dialogue about it, then, I, then you do need to um, take public comment as I think everyone understands clearly. Thank you, Mr. Mattis. Uh, I, so I will now then ask uh, my colleagues who brought this forward with me uh, where you, how you're feeling about this. And if uh, based upon what I'm hearing from uh, our uh, RTC attorney, uh, we do withdraw it, then we would just close the item without uh, having a discussion amongst the commission. In, in, the, in the interest of saving, uh, saving our commissioners and the public a lot of time, can I just ask Bruce McPherson uh, to really up or down whether you think this is a good idea or not, and I'll then quickly respond. Yeah, and I uh, and I really appreciate uh, Commissioner Rodkins uh, coming up with ideas. Some I support, some I don't, but I, I do not support this for several reasons. Um, you know, it doesn't have the signatures that the others did that worked two months to get, um, and. Um, It'll require the cost estimated at least a half a million to a million dollars. But I, I think it only served to uh, confuse the voters and continue the arguments that we've seen recently. And I hope that are going to be changed. 
And regarding the Greenway ballot measure, I just want to point out that on my motion Tuesday before the Board of Supervisors, I and I have not taken a position and not planning to take a position on Greenway. I want to make that clear. But um, I just asked the Board of Supervisors that we gather more information regarding the impacts of to the county if the Greenway measure passes. That has to do with everything from the general plan on. And so I want to, I think it's going to, we're going to get a clear uh, thought of what the real impact of it might be from the county's perspective and its general plan and so forth. Um, but I, I just, for, for cost purposes, for um, clarity purposes, I guess you'd say, I mean, people are going to vote it up or down, and I think they're going to say yes or no. And I think with more information coming from the county, we can be more direct in what those issues are that we're trying to to address. So I, I would not, I'm not going to be supporting this and um, and then with all due respect to you, Commissioner Rockin. Thank you very much. Uh, with the concurrence of my two uh, fellow uh, uh, commissioners who put this forward, I, I'm going to, with again, if they, if they support this, I don't want to leave them stranded, uh, uh, remove uh, my motion or my uh, the item. I'm not going to propose it. Um, uh, people can certainly, I'm sure people want to tell me they think, who think it was a bad idea would like to let me know. Uh, my email is open up, O-P-E-N-U-P -E at ucsc.edu. <laughs> Feel free to comment to me about it. I'm not trying to shut off your ability to, to speak up, but I really think we shouldn't drag everybody through a long hearing on this. And again, I'm going to ask Sandy and Eduardo whether they agree that withdrawing it at this point is acceptable to them. Yeah, just because um, just the, the, the legal issues and, and the timeliness, I, I, I concur. Uh, let's, let's remove it from the agenda. And I'll just say I concur as well. Thank you. Then it's withdrawn, and I think we can move uh, in the meeting at this point. Uh, thank you very much. And again, I, I think I had very straightforward and honest motives in putting it forward, but I don't think it would be productive at this point to proceed. Thank you. Okay, so uh, with the uh, the guidance from our attorney and the uh, concurrence of commissioners who initiated this item, uh, we will uh, go ahead then and withdraw it from consideration and uh, move on to our final uh, item for today, which is an announcement about our next meeting. And um, let's see, Director Preston did uh, announce that we have a transportation policy workshop uh, scheduled for February 17th. That's a, the third Thursday. And our next meeting for the RTC general meeting will be Thursday, March 3rd at 9 a.m. See you then. Thanks, everybody. Thank Sandy, a superb job of chairing this meeting. My God, the meeting. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And and also thank uh, Executive Director Preston for his report, which I think was excellent and probably reduced by half the number of people that felt they needed to comment after he was done. Thank you. Thank, thank you all. Thank you all for your uh, clear and and your restraint in in commenting today. I appreciate it. Um, we're adjourned.